Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 213. When is a board game too pretty? Board game graphic design taken too far. I'm Sean, and here with me, live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. For those of you not already here in the lobby, here on Twitch, we record live Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and it'd be great if you joined us for our next show. So tonight, we've got a rather subjective question from longtime fan of the show and local game designer Roger Malosh, who's asking about board game art and graphic design and when it can be taken too far. Now, following that pretty open discussion, we've got a hot preview of the latest rendition of the Fighting Fantasy Game Books. That's going to be followed by two reviews, one for a literati, a cooperative word game we called out on our best cooperative games episode just last week, and a small 18 card escape room in a box game from Grand Gamers Guild called The Independence Incident. We wrap up with a pretty busy week in review with an almost Sean number of games played, including first thoughts on a few games we brought back from Origins. Find links to the game we mentioned and sometimes other related links through our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 213. Let's start things going with a trip to the suggestion box. Now, welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some feedback and other comments we received on our content, both positive and negative. Now, last week's episode has been performing very well, and we got a number of comments recommending cooperative games we didn't talk about. Now, first off, we have Colonel Kurtz with Pandemic, maybe specifically any of the Pandemic Legacy series. Atlantis Rising is fairly fun. Flashpoint is one that people often forget about. The Initiative is a light, narrative-driven, legacy-style romp. Two that I'd like to get my hands on are Role Player Adventures and Dorf Romantic. And then we have some overlap here as Pamelty writes, no pandemic or flashpoint. I love flashpoint for its ease to teach a group. Good options for grownups and kids 12 plus can play it. Yeah, we almost had flashpoint on the list, but we actually included it on every single cooperative kids game list and the cooperative kids games that parents will enjoy list. So obviously we agree here to Melody. Um, I, I just feel like we've talked about Flashpoint on, on, enough, and it's it's kind of ironic that um, Colonel Kurtz there was saying that people often forget about Flashpoint. And I just kind of was like, we mentioned that every time the topic of co-op games come up, so we're going to skip that. Now, the other one here that overlaps is Pandemic. And I've got to say, for me, I just have no real interest in playing Pandemic after being part of a real Pandemic. There's just other themes I'd rather play. I don't even want any, I I don't even want to play a game about that at all. I don't want to watch TV shows about it. Even if the pandemic ends up being vampires, it's just nothing. I'm just done with pandemics. Now, as for Atlantis Rising, we did do a demo. Sean tried it as well at Origins, though it was very short and it does seem really solid. I, I love combining cooperativeness with push your luck that's a cool combination and i would love to try the full game now the other ones that were just mentioned though i have not tried but i would love to well next up we have pablo blowing your mind who says the captain is dead is a good one but the rule book does have a couple of things to be desired or that were not or leaves a couple of things to be desired that were not clear I've heard good things about that one, and I got to say, I want to try it. The premise is awesome, right? It's 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 lower decks. It's it's you are a, a a lower deckman on a Starfleet ship, and the captain is dead. Who's going to be the captain? The bridge crew's dead. You have to take over your unexperienced selves. And I absolutely adore the premise of that game, but I have not gotten to try that one. Well, next, I want to share a comment from Eric Lang on his feelings about Disney Sidekicks, which we reviewed back. In January of 2022. Now, Eric says, I remain quite proud of this game, even though I totally understand and even agree with the criticisms of packaging versus game design mismatch. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in the designer framing, it was intended to be a cooperative competitor to Villainous, which explains both the complexity and the difficulty. I feel so bad when parents buy it for their five year olds as an easy intro game. 
I'm really glad Eric shared this, actually. It makes sense that the game is wickedly difficult when it's supposed to be up there with Villainous as far as complexity goes. I can see the game as a competitor to Villainous, just unfortunately the publisher didn't present it that way. Where if they did, I think our review would have went completely the other way around. Absolutely. Well, next up is what could be considered a negative comment, though we don't see it that way. Falk Roosh, in regards to our Siege of Valeria review, writes, A math-heavy puzzle experience is not what I'm looking for in a game, unfortunately. See, I think this is an awesome comment because it points out that our review worked. The big goal we have with each of our reviews is to point out who should, as well as who shouldn't, pick up a specific game. And in this case, I'm proud of the fact we are able to steer someone away from a game they probably wouldn't have enjoyed had they picked it up. Absolutely. There's there's no benefit in us recommending a game for someone to go and hate review it on Board Game Geek or elsewhere. Yeah. Well, that does it for tonight. Remember, even if we don't read your comment, reply, or message out loud, we do appreciate hearing from you. All right. One heads up before we get to our main topic. Next week will be our five-year anniversary. We recorded our first episode on July 26th, 2018, which is next Wednesday. Yes, our anniversary actually falls on a recording night, which is pretty cool. So please be sure to join us next week live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, EDT currently, New York, Toronto, the, the, the big one, for a special anniversary episode. Now, at this point, we've had some pretty busy weeks. We're not sure exactly what we're going to do, but I think we're going to do more of a retrospective. Uh, usually on our anniversary episodes, we look at where we were, what we've done in the last year, and what we're going to do next. And obviously, there's some already been some big changes in the last year, though they've only mostly happened in the last month or so. But there's changes and what more might be coming. Now... As well as that, there's a really good chance we'll probably announce our next giveaway. That is, if Deanna can find some time to get it set up. And we'll probably have some door prizes for those of you who show up, including some stuff we brought back from Origins. So it's not the same door prizes we've had for the last couple of anniversaries. We actually got some new stuff in there, including some hot stuff from Czech Games Edition, CGE, who uh, hooked us up while we were at Origins. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from local Windsor gamer, game designer, and tabletop bellhop Patreon, Roger Malosh. Yeah, you too could be one of our Patreon patrons. Just head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and check out the various reward levels. Now, I personally think the hotel guest level is the sweet spot, but we appreciate any and all support we receive. Now, Roger is well known around these parts for sending us nice, long, detailed questions. So what do we have from Roger this week, Sean? Well, Roger writes, hey, Mo and Sean, I played pret a porter the other day with my wife. It's very well put together and looks great on the table. The complex mechanics were very intuitive and made perfect sense as we played the game. The art, however, was a little over the top. It took some effort to get past the graphics to concentrate on the important bits. I could have used a volume knob on the player board to turn the graphics down a bit so they weren't so <laughs> distracting. Have you ever run into this problem? When does the art in a game go beyond the point of immersion to become a distraction? When is a game too pretty? Well, first off, thanks for the question and your patronage, Roger. Great question, as always. Uh, so this one is uh, more so than many of the topics we talk about, very subjective. I think different people are going to tolerate different levels of busyness, art, and thematic depth to their games versus some other people that want things to be as abstract and easy to see as possible. So this is going to be our reviews on this subject, obviously, which are going to be different for everyone involved. For example, I'm going to call it out right away. I did find Preta Porter a little bright, but it's an Ian O'Toole design, a graphic design on an, on uh, and, and I actually appreciate 
a lot of the extra information that's there that stops me from having to look up stuff in the book. But that said, there is one column on the right hand side of the board that shows you the various phases of the game. And while I understand why it's there and the information it provides, I find that almost unreadable. It's just a bunch of icons that blur together that don't, to me, relate well to the actual game phases. But as for brightness and flashiness, it kind of fits. It's a game about fashion, so I understand the board being very flashy. I just wish the iconography was a little more clear. Fair enough. Well, I think our first answer, the easy answer, the, the let's go home now, we're done, is when it interferes with gameplay, then it's a problem. Like, really, that's that's the important thing is, yes, I love theming games and I love thematic games. Listen to our episode about theming games. And sometimes the theme can go too far. Uh, same is true of artwork. And I totally adore the, when when appropriate artworks in a game. But that is up until that makes the game harder to play in some way. Whether that's I can't find the information I need or it means they're showcasing the artwork so the iconography is made smaller so you can really show off that space station and the awesome artwork the artist supplied of that space station. Meanwhile, the important information isn't even that it's a space station, it's that it's a 3-2 card that provides this one resource. And that is when it becomes a problem. And it goes into something and um, I first heard on the Ludology podcast and I apologize for not knowing the name of the person who put forth this this the game design theory of the zones of play and we've talked about this on the show before where it's the the first zone is is cards in your hand going to like the sixth zone is the box and depending on where you want to find information you want it to be in the appropriate zone and that i think plays a big part in this Whereas if I have a card or something in my hand, you can fill that with all kinds of pretty stuff because I can easily see everything on the card. Whereas if I have a card I have to put down on a table, that needs to be less busy. There has to be less artwork. That's where the iconography and the important information really needs to stick out. And no, I don't remember if on the table is like round three because there's on the table and on the board are different. So like on the table in front of you versus in some other player's playing area, I think is number five. But I think everyone gets the gist of what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to, we, we did cover this once before, but I'm going to do a quick summary of Scott Rogers Thank zones you. of play, which zone one is the player's dominant hand zone yeah. two being the player's off hand zone. Three is your personal tableau zone. Four is the board or shared space zone. Five is the sideboard and zone six is the rule book. Oh, that's weird. It doesn't have the box. Okay. So uh, well, there I... is, it's, it's six or seven. Seven would be the box. It's, okay. it's kind of a, a an extra. Because I will admit, I have played a game that made me look up something in the box partway through. And I just thought that was terrible. <laughs> where you have to like go get cards from the box and add them to the game in the middle of what you were playing. Um, not going to call out what game it is, I guess. Though in this particular episode, maybe it would fit. Um, I think Sean was playing the game with me at the time, or Tori and Cat were. But it is a it was a dungeon crawling game where it gives you all the components to do what you're going to do, and then you open a door and it surprises you. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Like I, I like that you're giving me the surprise, but now I have to go find the game box and all the stuff again, which stank. I think one thing, and we've already, we called it out already, and I think, and Ryan's talking about it a little bit in the chat room, is board game art. And I think one of the things that may make that a big problem, especially with newer publishers or self-publishing, is art is expensive. Mm -hmm. Good art is even more expensive. And it can be a struggle to decide to sort of rein back this art that you've spent so much money on and are really proud of, even, you know, maybe you've done it yourself and you're really proud of the artwork for this game. It can be hard to think and stop and take that art and, and rein it back just a little bit yeah. in order to make the iconography or the rules or the text or whatever more visible. And that's mm -hmm. an easy mistake to make for, uh, you know, less experienced game designers. And so for a lot of the Kickstarters and self publishers, that's where you can sort of see that particular problem coming. Art is expensive. Show off the art you paid a lot of money for. That and some people are really hyped about the theme of their game. They're really into the fact that it's a cyberpunk horror Western, and they really want to show off this awesome world they've created. 
And that's great as long as it doesn't, again, impact the gameplay. Now, showing off a world generally works better in an RPG where you can also produce, say, an art book. There's a good example I hadn't thought of. So an example of this is Tales from the Loop having such fantastic artwork. Well, if you get the board game, if you back the Kickstarter, you could have got an art book. There's a great way to not have the problem Sean's talking about, where you can provide the game that's playable um, to varying degrees. You can check out a review why it might not be as playable as they'd hope, but it's not because of the graphic design um, and a, and being able to showcase that art. Now, it makes sense in this case because it's based on Stein and Style and Hogs art, which is it was an art book that inspired the game. But it'd be nice to see other games provide you with that artwork in a way that's not necessarily in the game like if you've got your new dungeon crawler i'm thinking a hellbringer off the top of my head so a dungeon crawler we did a diablo style game that had pretty good artwork on the cards if they're that proud of that artwork give me a, a hellbringer source book like a, a a background book or art book that shows off all those cards without the text and icons on top another example would be not necessarily thinking through so you've got your game board and you've got fantastic art. I'm going to go with a game that Mo just recently picked up. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, <laughs> which is a giant board which has the icon, the, the iconic image from the movie. It's, it's an unmistakable image. Anyone, you know, from like, you know, probably about 18 years or older would see this image and immediately recognize it. But that's the entire board when it's actually a square, a bunch of squares of numbers. Um, which become harder to read because this I iconic photo is taking up over the whole board. Yeah, and in yeah. that case, the, the board, like, you're searching areas, but the picture is the UFO in the mountain. Like, yeah. it it, it has, <laughs> it, it's a, it's a like, hide-and-seek game. It, it makes no sense. Yeah, it's, it's So, a, yeah, it's a really that's, that's another one. I, like, actually, make sure the art makes sense with the topic, like, of the game. I, I'm... I, I'm not going to come up with a game off the top of my head, I think, that does this. But there is definitely games I've played where I'm like, well, wait a minute. This isn't at all what I expected from this game based on the description. There are a number of things that can make the art too much. Um, like we're talking about big, pretty pictures, right, that take up more of a card or more of the board than they should. But there's more to it than that. You can also have clashing artwork. If you have too many different art styles, that can bring people out of a game. Now, an example of this that many people bring up is Terraforming Mars. Terraforming Mars is a mix of stock photos, digital artwork, and hand-drawn stuff that they must have paid for. Like, I don't I don't even know where they got it from. Now, I will admit it, it doesn't bother me much. I am not one of those people that hates on the art in Terraforming Mars. But if that's what you're paying attention to on the cards, it's just there's no unified feel. So by having a diverse amount of art that doesn't match can bring people out of the game. Can get into some garish design. Uh, I, I think back to the days when, uh, you know, home publishing became a thing when the Macintosh was first new and everyone all of a sudden had access to be able to print their own self-published documents with 6,000 fonts on them and mm. all the clip art you could imagine. And it was painful on the eyes and people realized all of a sudden that, oh, wait, this whole this whole layout and, and, and design thing is actually a little harder than we thought. Uh, yep. You can't just slap 17 fonts onto a page and make it, uh, make it happy to read. Now, another one is brightness and contrast. We've seen this um, too low and I've seen it too high. It seems very common in, again, independent Kickstarter games, newly produced games, not by well-known publishers, that I think things look great on the screen. But then when they print it, it's way too dark. And I think that's just a difference that people have to account for. And I don't know if they're not getting proofs or why, why this ends up in the end product. But we have played a number of games where when the card art shows up, it's too dark. Now, this could be the like art as in it looks pretty art, but also like the design. I've also played way too many dungeon crawl games where I can't see the grid on the map. And that's an important thing that needs to be there during play. Or the grid on the map is there, but it's the same color as the artwork. Like there's just, you need to have that contrast and to make what's important in the game stick out. And then how many other games have you played? Hex games, war games, old school war games, hex encounter war games, where you're like, okay, they tried to go with a realistic map. And there's a reason most war games are just like colored squares, because when they try to make it nice, it's like, okay, there's a bit of forest showing into this hex. 
Does that mean that's a forest hex? Is that partially forested? What percentage of a hex has to be covered by trees for it to count as forested? Now that interferes with gameplay, not because it's too busy or too bright or you don't like the look of it, but because it's providing in clear information. Yeah. One Now, one real big problem, and Brian, we, Mo mentioned it, and again, Ryan's bringing it up in the chat, is the difference between screen and print. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one of the huge problems, and I know this as a photographer, uh, one of the number one problems in displays, both in your phones, your home computers, is your monitors, your what you're viewing things on, are almost guaranteed to be too bright. Um, and this is this is... This is just a problem. It's it's a the a lot of manufacturers have decided that that bright is better. It punches through more, so they actually up their brightness and some of the the, the modes you can go into punch up brightness more. But mm-hmm. if you actually calibrate, you know, get a proper device and calibrate your screens, everything gets a whole lot <laughs> duller essentially. <laughs> um, and then. Another f- fantastic feature of, of Photoshop and Lightroom is the ability to uh, give it a, a concept. So I, I can say, oh, I'm going to be printing on this kind of paper. And, it, mm. and uh, on a calibrated screen, it will show me the difference between what I'm seeing on my monitor and what it's going to look like when it prints. Right. Again, you can't take that perfectly, but on a calibrated screen, you can get pretty accurate. But there aren't that many people out there these days who are calibrating their monitors uh, mm-hmm. And it gets even worse when you get into mobile devices because a lot of them have dynamic color spaces where they are actually punching up colors mm-hmm. deliberately using AI on the fly to make photos look better. When I in in quotes um, in loud quotes, uh, just because you know they want to show off their devices better, and that that punchy photo makes their yep. device look better. And Dana just brought up something that's come up in the chat that's affected our blog posts and even the pictures in our reviews is the tilt on a laptop. In particular, your tilt of your monitor completely changes the brightness. Mm -hmm. And she sat down, done a ton of work on photo editing on photos she took with her good professional camera, but had the laptop at an angle where it looked great. And then we go to use it on the blog and she sends it to me and I'm like, whoa, this is super dark or, oh, my God, that's so washed out. It just it's it's one of those things like a WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get is never actually true on a computer, as far as I can tell. Yeah, no, I can't. I, and I mean, and, and Ryan brings up uh, you know photo accurate monitors. Should you can get you can spend twelve thousand dollars for uh, you know a full full gamut monitor, but even mm-hmm. without that, you can still calibrate and get things really close. Again, this is on a uh, on a on a computer monitor, not a laptop, because unfortunately, on a laptop you can calibrate it, but Again, that viewing angle makes such yeah, a huge difference angle. that even if it's calibrated, if you tip it back too far or too or close too far, it is uh, it is a struggle. Now, other things that we can do to make things more clear uh, contrast um, re- repetition is something else that's important. So if you have, say, I don't I, that trick taking game works, but it's too easy. But like a suit, make all the cards in the same suit look similar. Well, it's awesome that you have all these awesome different character arts for each of your one through 10 aces and they all look amazing. Make them at least look like aces instead of having to rely on people looking at the iconography. Now, throw that into a board game. If we're looking at something where you can build five different types of buildings and commercial buildings are are one thing and, and residential buildings are another, make the commercial buildings all green. Make the residential buildings all red or something similar to that make it so that things that look similar are similar or grouped together in the game yeah exactly similar with similar and different different from others uh yes. is all it, it, it's it's similar to contrast but in in a graphical format rather than an actual uh, level thing you want to make sure that at a glance that the things that need to be different in a game are easily seen as different. You don't want to force your players to be staring and looking and, you know, poking around and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's what in their hand or on their player boards or on the board. Uh, Make it easy for your players to play your game and they'll play it more. And, And honestly, I've definitely seen this where it's too busy. 
Like there's just too many different things that that look like they're unrelated that are, or the opposite's also true. Like Sean kind of mentioned a bit there, but also make the things that are different from each other look different. So the things that should be the same should look the same. Things that are different. You don't want someone, I don't know, mixing up a, a mode of transportation from one of your buildings. And no, obviously, I have no specific game in mind when I'm describing these examples. I, you know, and, and I'm actually going to call out a specific game here because we didn't okay. put it on our list uh, later and we could have. Uh, and that's Dolce. Uh, one of the yep. things that Dolce did was the the icons for the type of product that was needed for each candy shop was a little on the small side. And it became really difficult to understand at a glance what kind you needed, but also how much of that you need. So there were two pieces of information being relayed from each little graphic, and they mm -hmm. were so small that neither piece of information came through clearly. Yeah. And, and that was just a failing of the graphic design in that game. Other things that can make it too much or, or what we can do to make things clear. We're going to group things together. Um, the busyness, like you have to people's eyes. I, the, the big thing I'm thinking is rule books here. White space is important. That's not just true for rule book reading. You have to give spots for the eyes to relax or the, and, and group things into areas. If you cover every square inch of your board with something, it's just going to be overwhelming and 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 too much to see the same goes for the cards in your hand player boards the the player mat or whatever the, the cover of your rule book or sorry the cover of your box can even be a problem with this if you cover every square inch with artwork the eyes don't know where to focus yeah there's there's a lot of theories uh again because photography is something i know about how to draw the eye to places and how mm -hmm. to how to use the the shapes and and directions and lines in your images to move the eye and if you just pack it full of stuff your eye doesn't stop moving you, yeah you, you, you they're looking everywhere but if you're looking everywhere you're not taking in anything um so so give the eye somewhere to go and then somewhere to go next uh don't make the eyes just constantly be sweeping around trying to figure out where they're supposed to be and then follow the the regional standards like here in north america and in many parts of the world we read left to right top to bottom don't design your board so that phase one is in the bottom right and phase 10 is in the top left that's just going to mess people up they expect to follow either perfectly clockwise in a spiral or they want to go left to right top to bottom but if you're making it for a different market, that's not necessarily yes, going to be the that's... same everywhere. Uh, if, if you're importing your, your game from uh, something that was made in the Japanese market, you are going to have a different pattern than left yes. to right, top to bottom. Now, one of the things I recommend is tie that to your theme, if you are going to do that. But that gets into thematic games <laughs> and integrating your theme appropriately. Now, this one's interesting. So we have the benefit of having a long-term fan who has um, vision issues in our chat room right now. So Red Meeple Ryan just pointed out that one of the things you definitely need when using Braille in games is that white space gap between or else it just becomes too much. So it was something we kind of mentioned in our lobby earlier. Can a game have too much, too many bits, too much to touch that becomes confusing? Well, yes, it can. And uh, let's let's take a look at some examples okay. uh, from games we've played that uh, maybe aren't the best. We'll start with that, and when we'll we'll show off some of the nice ones later. All right. So the first one, Deanna has actually already called it out. Someone else. That's our editor, and she games. Thank you, Deanna, for all the work you do in the background. Um, she has brought up Thrones of Valeria. This is one of the trick taking card games that was in my head when we were when we were talking earlier. This is a game with very busy cards. The artwork is by the Miko. It's not even Miko's usual style. It's a line art. It's it's extremely well done and it's very neat. I get wanting to show that off. But it is very much at the expense of playability in a number of different ways. Um, for one, it is a trick-taking card game where the cards are not flippable. To me, that is a huge faux pas. Anyone that plays a trick-taking card game should be used to using standard bicycle-style playing cards, and they have a certain design for a reason, and people expect trick-taking games to feel like that. This does not. Then there are the choices in color, which make parts of the cards unreadable. That is followed up by deciding to make the games look dirty. And I think I'll let Sean talk about that part because it bothered him more than me. 
Yeah, again, this is the first game I have ever found myself trying to wipe off cards because of graphical choices. Uh, yeah, it was that's... just a bizarre choice, and it not only uh, made uh, the the visual visual look muddy, uh, it it muddied the graphics and the readability of everything. Uh, and while I understand the theme that they were going for, I I get it. They wanted that dirty tavern feel. Unfortunately, it came at the expense of some levels of playability. Yeah, and there were some really odd choices. Like they tried to make the cards worn, but where they made them worn isn't actually where you hold the cards. So even if they were going for that thematic immersion of, oh, these are grimy cards that have been held by a thousand hands before you, they even failed at getting that across by making it illogical where the wear was on the cards. There were just so many choices in this game that I think could have been done better. To the fact that I think I would rather play the game with cards with no word. Like, just give me the iconography, because that's the other problem is the iconography on these cards is hidden in the top left corner and is almost as small as possible. And what people may not realize of the brilliance of the bicycle cards is the suit is repeated in the in the card. It's not just in the corner. If there's eight aces, eight of aces has eight hearts on it. eight of aces, eight of hearts has eight hearts on it not counting the corners and you get the number by counting them or by the number in the corner and the heart symbols there. And then there's a color like all of that was just thrown out to give you this totally new look where they decide all the information is down the left hand side and ooh, look at Biko's art. And it's a shame because frankly, we like Thrones of Valeria yep. as a trick taking card game. They have made some really interesting choices, some unique choices that make it a fun game. Yes. But it's hard to bring to the table because of some of the design choices. So unfortunately, as much as we are fans, it's probably not going to get played as much as it could if it had just been bright, clear card. Yeah, like I can't see bringing that game to the barbershop bar. Well, I have, but like regularly because of the color choices. Yeah. That place, it's it's we're playing in a bar. It's it's not the best lit area. It's not my nice game room with lots of you know bright lights all over the place. And some of the card colors are just too hard to read, making the game literally unplayable. So next up, we've got another game, and now we are really, we swear, we're not <laughs> picking on Daily Magic games. Yeah, but we have played a lot of Valeria games recently, and that's the the reason why we're getting to Castellans of Valeria here. Uh, and to be fair, also, we have only played the prototype version of this. We yes. haven't seen the final version. Yeah, the big problem here is is it's similar to the Thrones of Valeria. Again, we have Miko's artwork, and I understand them wanting to show off Miko's artwork. And instead of highlighting the art, they put tiny iconography which is in zone five. If I remember from earlier, it's not even on the game board. It's on a sidebar. So you are looking at the second from the box, like, like, or sorry, the rule book, like, like as far away as possible, these cards are at the extreme limit of your gameplay area and they have tiny icons on them and they are tiny detailed icons, not like big stars and triangles. You're talking a handout with a little die dropping into it with maybe an arrow on the bottom, which means one thing or an arrow on the top that means another. Yeah, these were really unfortunate. And to be fair, uh, my takeaway from our preview of the game was that citizen cards are a vital aspect of getting the most out of this game. And mm -hmm. yet at the exact same time, we didn't use citizen cards to get the most out of the game because of the iconography. Players were actively avoiding using that aspect of the game, actively avoiding one of the main actions in the game that allows you to place citizens on the board and collect these cards to give you like great game breaking abilities that, that should be a huge part of the game because they couldn't bother to lean over and ask and look and see what it is. And then we get to zone six, because the other thing is there's no summary of these icons that was easily available. Now, from what I hear, that will be fixed. That was a prototype issue, but even then it's in the rule book. It's not on a player reference card. It's not on the board. So it's it, in a way is two fails on that part. Now, in theory, if we had owned the game and been playing it regularly with the with the updated uh, guide sheet, we would probably mm -hmm. learn them and yes. get there. But 
we've played it a number of times. I've played it at least three or four times. And I couldn't tell you right now what those icons mean without looking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I know, know some of them, but not yeah, all, but not enough of them to, to be confident playing that game without having a reference sheet in front of me. Now, again, we're not picking on you daily magic, but that game also had another problem. And that was, they were really excited about this board that showed a district with a bunch of cities and putting tons of wooden pieces on it to make it look like the city's growing. And in a way, they nailed it because that is one of my favorite aspects of this game is how empty everything starts at the end of the game and how busy it looks at the, the, the end. And, and it works. It feels like you're building a city. So they nailed that part of it. But what they failed to do were to differentiate certain buildings or things you could build from others. Now, in general, this is great because in the game, every building's worth one point except for windmills. And windmills are in a spot that makes it very clear that they're worth half a point. And it would be fantastic if that was it. The problem is there are monuments you can build that score points every round and work differently from everything else. And while they gave you spots on the board to put them, they were kind of muddied and we didn't even notice one of them until our second game. And there was nothing to set it out once you put it. So you just, you're looking and you're like, yeah, there's a bunch of yellow there and blue and red. And obviously yellow has a majority and blue has this and red has this. So everyone gets these points. And then you notice two rounds later, you're like, oh, wait, that was a windmill. For one, it didn't count towards area majority. So blue should have actually tied with red. And the other thing is that building could have been scoring every round and we forgot the last two rounds. So can I have my three points? Like it's, it's a mess. Yeah. Now we understand that there are, they, they are talking about changing uh, some of the graphics on those uh, pieces. But again, we will have to wait until until uh, we, we see the final product to know just what kind of changes. Yeah, that one was pointed out by multiple reviewers. And from what I understand, they are working on a solution. So hopefully Daily Magic, by the time people start getting their copies of Castellans of Valeria from the very successful Kickstarter, it'll look even better. And we won't have any of these complaints. All right, well, next up is a game that we never really talked about for a long time. Well, <laughs> now we've got now we now we like it and now we've got to bring it down a little bit. Yeah, and that's Scythe. Now, most of Scythe is fantastic. I, I have very few complaints about Scythe. Uh, the double layer player boards are great. Talk about, you know, zone three and having all the information you need. Very readable. I the only thing I really need to know what other players are doing is where what action they're taking to see if I get the lieutenant bonus and well even that's done well with a nice chunky piece i can see from across the table it all works great that is until i lean over and look at the board and try to figure out what the different terrain types are jamie made the choice or the artist i'm assuming jamie made the choice to make the map look realistic right you you it's hexagon based but things kind of overlap a bit and by being this post-apocalyptic thick wasteland look it all kind of blends together it all looks very brown and red now you need to know what each terrain type is for various reasons um one to figure out what resources they produce if you're going to get extra characters if there's a tunnel presence that lets you move around the board all of that's important information and what they did they did make artistically each look different but i find they all blend together they did give you icons but these icons are the smallest things on the board. They, they are one-tenth, maybe, the size of the hexes. And in this case, for gameplay ability, I would have preferred the whole hex was that symbol. I don't need the farm to look like a farm with fields on it. I just need to see the symbol that means if I sit there and I have a worker there, I get grain. That's what I need to know. This was an unfortunate thing because, again, this game has done so many things fantastically well. Uh, and even overall, the board looks great. Yeah. Except they have taken this one rather important piece of information and shrunk it down to a ridiculously small size compared to how important that information is yes. for the players. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, because even not even just generating resources, there's also the most complicated part of the game. The part that trips up every player who's ever played Scythe is the way river walk works. Now, in the game, at the start of the game, you can't get across rivers. You're, you're kind of stuck in one small area. That is until you bring caves or you unlock the river walk ability. And the river walk ability lets you move into specific types of terrain. And everyone messes this up. They even give you here. Here's them, Jamie, trying to do it right. 
giving you a level one card, a card you can pick up and look at to show you where you can river walk into. But that doesn't help when I can't tell what the tiles are on the board. When, when you add complexity to an already complex mechanic, that is a problematic design. And again, it became, a, a, it, it is, is in the end, a graphical choice yes. uh, to have made that a little bit more difficult to understand. Now, what I don't know is if this improves, because I know later Scythe eventually released um, random map tiles and stuff like that. And perhaps even on the neoprene map version of the board, it might be more clear than it is now. I, I can't talk to that. All I own is the original game and a couple of expansions that don't affect this either way. Well, next up, we've got one where the artwork was kind of locked in from the beginning. Yeah. There, you were pretty much going to get the artwork you got no matter what when you got my Little Pony's Adventures, Adventures in Equestria, the deck building game. Yeah, this one makes sense, right? The game's based on a cartoon. So, of course, it has cartoon style artwork. And to be even more thematic, they actually got one of the IDW comic books artists from My Little Pony to do all the artwork in this game. And I got to say, as far as a, oh, look, at it's a My Little Pony game with pretty My Little Pony art, it wins. It's exactly what you'd expect, and it's exactly what I would want out of a My Little Pony looking game. They even even have little, you know, standees and the standees work like it looks great, but there are some serious usability issues in this game. And again, we have gotten to sort of the same issue that we were talking about earlier, where, yes, the art is important. I mean, the art is very important. It's My Little Pony. Um, My Little Pony is a is a a look more than anything mm -hmm. else. Um, you know, it started as, as little, little dolls that, you know, have a, had a specific style and look to them. And so while you can't compromise that look, they went sort of too far in the other direction by minimizing iconography in order to ensure that no detriment was ever made to the look of the ponies. And that mm -hmm. makes the game a little harder to play. Yeah, and it, this is another one of those cho choices of color and contrast. So one of the things they did right is they put all of the resources you get from a card in the same spot all the time. So if you get friendship, it's always in this same spot of the card. If you're getting movement, it's always in the same spot of the card. The big problem is on one of the basic cards, the generic movement card that everyone gets, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the card offhand. They happen to put the movement symbol, which is a black arrow over a very dark tree, and the two blend together. This one so much so that almost every time I teach the game, someone will hand me that card and say, what's this card do? Because they don't see the icon. Yeah, it literally blends in so wonderfully well, I suppose. It, it's this chameleon-like symbol that isn't, I mean, it, it's not a a, a, a bad symbol. It, the symbol itself actually makes yeah. sense. It's good iconography, but because of... The order in which thing the I have to assume it's the order in which you know card art and iconography and things were all designed that it ended up in this place that with the art that had been chosen for that card probably well in advance it it blended into the background you've got this chameleon yeah. icon that uh, is very problematic. Oh, I'll admit it's one of those things. Once you know it's there, you can't help but see it, and it's fine. But it's just how many people, the number of people I've been ask me, "What's this card do?" And I'm like, "Oh," and it's not like the bottom of the card. You know how Terraforming Mars? One thing that Terraforming Mars did really well is every card explains exactly what it does, even if it's extremely clear what the card does. That's not here. There's no, you know, generates two movement and, which if they had that, that would have fixed the issue in a way. Now, this game does have another problem, which gets back into the zones of play problem, and that is extremely small iconography on some of the other cards in the game. Not, not the cards you're going to hold in your hand, specifically the, yeah, the location cards and also some of the, um, the trouble cards, the, the things you're trying to overcome. But worst is on, on the location cards. And that is with, again, the, the basic resource symbols. And in particular, the help symbol. The help symbol is a horseshoe with a number in it. This has shrunk down so small. Like, I don't know what point font it is, but it's like eight or six or something uh, on these uh, cards. Four or three or four, I think, is probably yeah. the, the actual answer. Again, you've got, because uh, I believe it, I believe I recall it's in a circle. So it's a circle with a horseshoe with a number. 
and the entire the entire icon is less than the 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 diameter of a pencil eraser. Yeah, it's oh, it's, it's way smaller than that. <laughs> and it, so, it's smaller diameter than the capital letters and the sentences it's in. Yeah. Like, and 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 it just it becomes uh you know, for someone with vision difficulty it's impossible. For someone with good eyes it's still difficult. Like to be fair, at zone 1 I have a hard time. In my dominant hand in front of my face I I can't read some of these. My kids have a hard time reading them across the table and they have way better eyes than I do. So it's not just my age in this. Yeah. And there's no and there's no differentiation uh in color or any graphic between, you know, 6 and 8 inside yep. the horseshoe. It's exactly the same uh, and it's the same color as the text around it, I believe. Yeah. It's 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 like a font. Like if they were taping, they 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 have like a five horseshoe key on their keyboard. Like it just, you know, it's in there. And, and I find that extremely frustrating. And that's one where, like, until you've memorized the cards, you're constantly going to be, okay, now I do know they tend to be either, I forget now, say five or eight. And I'm like, okay, is that a five one or an eight one? And and I've learned that I can at least differentiate that it's one of the two. <laughs> but it's almost but worth taking it. a Sharpie and drawing a big five over top of this yeah. tiny little uh, icon because the icon is useless. Now, interestingly, this I don't think is much art based. This is just they pack too much information on one small card. Yeah. So it's it, this is more of a graphic design issue than a yeah the the it, art's too nice and the thematic yeah, the movement is, the movement resource card is definitely an art issue. That's an art issue. But this yeah the the iconography is, is something else. And to be fair, the movement one isn't the only one. There are lots of cards where where it's a little more difficult than I'd like, and the resources blend in with the art more than I would like. All right, the last example I am going to pull up is Aldabas Doors of Cartagena. Now, it's a game about big doors with huge knockers, so I get that the art and card design would focus on the doors and their knockers, but that's some of the least useful information while playing the game. The door color, in particular, is the thing you notice first when looking at one of these cards. This only matters for one simple placing rule that you can't put two doors of the same color next to each other. That's the only reason the color matters, and it is the most prominent thing on the card. No. Now, next is the knockers. The knockers stick out more. Now, those matter, sort of, because they indicate the suit of the card. But the thing is, the art's based on a real-life thing. So I get it. You want it to look as similar as possible. And cards in the same suit all, say, have fish on them. But the various fish, it's like, is that one fish? Is that two fish? The fish that are both facing both ways, is that a two fish? I can't even tell. So that is almost useless to anyone playing the game. And instead, you're going to look to the icons in the top left of the card. But those are tiny. And it just, I, there just has to be a better way to get the information that's important. Like the card design looks great and you don't even know it's a problem until you start playing and realize what I need to know is hard to find. Yeah. Again, these are beautiful and they are representing the real life doors of Cartagena. Uh, the, you know, this is a real thing. This is a tourist destination and the people of called, uh, of uh, Cartagena are proud of this heritage of door knockers and the levels of respect that certain door knockers and styles and, you know, the more fancy it is, the more uh, powerful that person is. Mm -hmm. And it represents what guild they belong to. And I get it. That's very important. And it is important to respect the heritage and mm -hmm. the history behind that. But at the same time, this is a game. Yeah. And in order to play the game, you need certain pieces of information. And trying to decipher the code of door knockers is not how you get that information. Yeah, so that's our that's our five examples of a problematic artwork in games that maybe may in fact have been able to have been done better. But we want to lend this on a positive note. So why don't we find three examples of great integration of art and playability? So the first one I want to call out is Boop. Because it should be too much. You are taking a basic abstract strategy game that I could play on the beach with a stick where I can draw some lines and some colored stones and turning it into a game where you take the game box and flip it over. Then you put a quilted 
much board on top of it to form the playing area. Then you are handed six cat meeples, or sorry, kitten meeples that are super cute, bent over with their tails in the air. And then you also have eight cat meeples, which are much chunkier with their pointy ears sitting upwards. Then you have to differentiate the two teams. So one is orange calico cats and the other are gray cats. And we silk screen them all so that the cats actually look unique between the teams beside their colors. So just in case perhaps someone has difficulty seeing orange and gray, you can tell the difference by their stripes and their belly colors. It is so over the top and ridiculous, but it all works. None of this gets in the way of the game at all. You have these over the top pieces and, and seriously, one of the silliest game boards ever. It's an upside down box with a quilted board put on top of it. So it looks like a bed, but it all works. There is, there is no impact to the, no negative impact to the gameplay at all, but a huge positive impact for the theme of the game of cats jumping onto a bed and booping each other and trying to get a row of cats and lined up to be able to win the game. And on top of theme, you get accessibility. Uh, yeah. So you've got that as well. And, and one of the things that I, when I, when I first looked at it, my first thought was, Oh, you know what, with this quilt, you know, is it going to be, is it going to be problematic? Is, is our things going to tip over? Are things going to not be lined up? It's not a problem at all. Uh, for whatever reason, despite the fact that they could have just made a bunch of squares on the back of the box, they went to this next level and it just works. And, and it's not at all problematic. None of the concerns I had when I looked at uh, a product like that and, and the potential concerns that sort of leapt into my mind looking at it, none of them came to pass. Uh, it was really easy to play on. Things weren't falling over. You, things it wasn't hard to get it into a into you know right in right into the square where you needed it. Yep. it, it all just made sense and worked. And yet, it's yeah. a very artistically designed game. And it's awesome because the designer did not design it like this. This was all done by smirk and laughter. Clay took the game, and and gave it this theme. And that's why it won Game of the Year at the uh, the Origins Award. Well, not Game of the Year. It was it was the the fan choice, the Gamma fan choice of the year because of this theme. Like everyone was talking about this game while we were at Origins. It is just so like you you can't help it. It's a game about booping cats off a bed, <laughs> and it looks like you have little cats, and you're even you're gonna then there's a bed for them to bounce on. Like it's just like I said, it should be. In the list of over the top, this is ridiculous. Why did they do all this? I could play this with a piece of paper and some coins. Like if someone had dime, dimes and nickels on one side and Canadian on the other, you could play this game. But it works. I, I, I had to include this in a great example because I, I swear it's like it's on the limit. Like if they had made every kitten unique, it might have just been that part that just a little too much. Yep. Nope. They did a fantastic job. And that was Boop by Smirk and Dagger. Next up, we've got... Azul, like we haven't talked about this one a few times. Yeah, this is just an absolutely beautiful game. I, it just, the thing is, it fits the theme so well. This is a board game about placing individual tiles in a pattern on a wall to make a, pa a, a specific pattern that's, that's known for it in a region of Portugal. It's a, it's a Portuguese style thing. And what they give you are tiles. Now, no, they're not ceramic tiles that you would put on an actual wall. Instead, they're plastic, but they're that shape, they're that size, they're that texture that it feels like you are manipulating tiles. And then you are putting them on a wall. The difference is the wall's flat. It's in whatever zone three, your tableau, and you're placing pieces down onto a wall. I, I, there, there's a bit of a weird theme with the factories and grabbing tiles, but just the components feel so good. They sound so good clacking together in the bag when you shift them up. Like the only complaint I can actually see artistically and, and usability with Azul is the fact the playboards are flat and things can slide around. Now, I never had a problem with that with the actual tiles, but the score marker is pretty easily bumped. But the designers must have realized this because they put out an expansion called Crystal Mosaic, and now everything even stays in its place, and it even gives a kind of lacquered look to the wall. Yeah, and on top of it, they didn't minimize, minimize the design. I mean, there is fantastic art over the factories and everything out there, mm. 
but it is low enough, uh, it is, uh, you know, subdued enough that it doesn't distract from the tiles that are on top because the tiles that are sitting on top of the factories or sitting on top of your board are really all that matter. Mm. Everything else is window dressing and they treated it that way. They yep. could have easily made it bright and pretty and, and gorgeous, but it would have distracted. And they very deliberately took those levels down so that they were there. They were pretty, but they do not distract from the only thing in the game that matters, which is the tiles. Yeah, the tiles and where you place them. Now, they did extra steps, of course, by adding patterns to some of the tiles, um, which looked great, but added bonus for accessibility. That was actually done for colored blindness issues so that you can easily tell similar looking colors under different types of color blindness apart. And I'm like, man, that's like next level. Like, like that's that's taking like you're being more artistic while making the game more playable. Like, can you do a better job? All right. So let's last one. Last one. Our last uh, call out for good design would be Vinhos Deluxe. I wanted to bring this one up because Preda Porter is is a Vitalis Erta game with artwork by Eno Tool. So I wanted to find a game that's on the opposite end of the spectrum, one that I think nails being able to impart a ton of information, a Vital Lacerda amount of board game knowledge on a board and player boards without going over the top, without going too far. Yes, it's a busy board. There are a lot of different things on that board, but it's a busy game. It's a heavy Euro with a lot of different things going on, going on. But what Ian was able to do with this one was break up the board using things like white space and artwork to break up the mechanical parts of the board where you're placing or taking things, as well as showing you the flow of the game using that left to right up to down thing I was talking about before you start the game, having to purchase vineyards. Well, the first thing in the top left is your map of the region. Uh, is this also Portugal? I think it might be. I can't remember now where the Rhine region is in Vigno. Sorry, bad Mo. Um, but that's the first thing you're going to do is do that. And then yes, you've got the, the next phase of the game. And while there's a whole other half of the game where you're going to wine shows, wine wine cons and showing off your wine well that's on the other half of the board so it's like here's one part of the game here's the other part of the game clearly differentiated and right there smack dab in the middle of the board the clearest thing the brightest thing it's white separated from everything else is the worker placement grid which everyone is going to interact with every turn like it just it, it it's a it's a lesson in fantastic art integration with game mechanics and iconography like, I, I can't think of anything wrong with this game. And then there's added artistic touches. Like, the player reference cards look like wine menus. Little things like that. Now, mechanically, or, or, or what, like, for imparting information, they're perfect. There's lots of white space. The text is large enough. The iconography is clear. But the fact they made them a threefold with a cover just brings that to that next level. And this is one where there was a distinct difference. There's a reason that we are talking about Vinhaus Deluxe. Yes. Because the original Vinhaus that wasn't designed by Ian O'Toole, while beautiful, was distracting. It was mm -hmm. over the top. There was too much design, art, art, artistic design, which interfered with the iconography and the readability of it. And what you notice if you do a side-by-side -side view between the two boards, informationally, they're more or less the same. There isn't all that much difference gameplay-wise between the boards. But what Ian has done has been to, again, reduce the sort of the level, turn down the volume, as Roger may, you know, mentioned in his question, turn yeah. down the volume on some of that artistic design uh, used more muted colors, which allows the information, the gameplay to pop out off of the board while yep. still leaving a lot of the designs. And yes, it is Portugal uh, of that Portuguese so. wine region and, and the Portuguese feel of the game to still exist. But again, down a little bit lower where it's not interfering with what matters to a board game player. Well, that is it for our talk on 
board game aesthetics. How some games take things a bit too far. What does board game art, when does art, board game art become a bit too much for you? Let us know about it in the comments below or fire off an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, if you've got a question for us, just hit us up with an email, this time to questions at tabletopbellhop.com so it doesn't get lost in the inbox or head over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to our preview of Fighting Fantasy Adventures. Choose your own adventure books turned into group dungeon crawls from Martin Wallace. Fighting Fantasy Adventures is a solo or cooperative game designed by Martin Wallace based on the Fighting Fantasy game books by Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston. While our prototype copy contained placeholder art from the final game, we'll be uh, having artwork from Rupert Lewis, Jones, Jeremy Love, and Monstre. Now, the original plan for this game was to kickstart, but that didn't go so well as they had hoped, and they currently have a preview page up right now at GameFound with a lower price point and a few more incentives. Now, this crowdfunding campaign is being run by Wallace Designs. This is Martin Wallace's new publishing company, with the final game not expected to get to backers until 2024. How's that for new hotness from us, folks? Yeah, you don't get that often here. Now, Fighting Fantasy Adventures plays one to four players with a single quest taking one to three hours. Now, the final box will contain four adventures, the Warlock of Firetop Mountain, Island of the Lizard King, Death Trap Dungeon, and the Forest of Doom. And Forest of Doom is actually broken over two parts, names of which should be very familiar to Fighting Fantasy gamebook fans. According to Martin, getting through all of these adventures should take a group between 10 and 15 hours, but that's just with a single playthrough of each. As we learned while playing our prototype version, there's a good chance you're going to want to try some of these more than once, if or maybe when you fail on that first go. Now, we've mentioned it a couple times already, but I want to make this as clear as possible. The copy of the game we got to play, in which we're talking about right here, and which is sitting over my shoulder, is a prototype reviewer copy. It is not a finished product, and we've been very clearly told that the artwork in particular is not at all final. Now, you can see more current artwork on the tabletop simulator version of the game or on the now-canceled Kickstarter page. Or on the current game game found preview page now another interesting thing they did so we could do this preview without spoiling anything for you the viewer is to provide us with a reviewer adventure mm -hmm. what we played through isn't actually going to be included in the game box so that way we could talk about the experience and not ruin any of the included adventures which i gotta say that is fantastic big props to Martin's new company for this. Like, that is just awesome. They, they wrote a specific adventure to not spoil anything. I would love to see that for more adventure games. Now, Fighting Fantasy Adventures is a card-driven dungeon crawl based on the classic game books that many of us grew up playing. Now, similar to the game books, you're going to be choosing which way to go, finding cards that match the number of where you went, and then making decisions based on what you read on the card. Now, this may lead to combat with various vicious monsters, which is handled by a simple 2d6 opposed role system. Now, your asymmetric characters have various skills they can use, and working together will be key to winning the game. Now, how you win is determined by what scenario you're playing, and one of my favorite lines I've ever seen in a rule book is, you will know when you win this game. Now, normally, we don't do unboxing videos for previews, but since we think this game is going to make quite the splash, and the fact that Mo was already in front of the camera and live when he cracked open the package, we figured why not? So if you want to take a look at the prototype components that we got in our copy, Fighting Fantasy Adventures preview, <laughs> be sure to check out our unboxing on YouTube. Now, due to this being a prototype, I don't want to say too much about component quality here. They're usually I get into details of what I liked and I didn't, because most of what we got to play with is going to change. Now, what I will say is I like the direction they're going. Everything seemed to work really well at the table. We found the information very clear and easy to find and well presented. My only real hope at this point is that the counters are a little bigger in the final copy. They're a little little and fiddly. I do love, though, how short and clear the rules were. 
a lot of this game is left to be discovered once you start playing, once you're actually digging into the decks. And speaking of rules, it's time to move on to an overview of play. So one great thing about fighting fantasy adventures is how quick you can jump right in. Setting up just involves everyone picking a character or characters to play because all four characters need to be in play during every game. So if you're playing solo, you're going to play, play all four of them. If you're two players, you can each take two or whatever you want to mix it up there. Now, each character is represented by a character card and a number of skill cards. You're going to take your character cards and find the level one skill cards and put them face up in front of you. Now, each of these skill cards features a one-time use ability, and when you use them during the adventure, you're going to flip them over. Now, these abilities include things like the healer healing and the wizard casting fireball or the fighter using his shield or the scout stabbing people in the back. Our prototype also included level two, three and four cards, most of which match the skills the character already had, meaning Mm -hmm. that as you level up, you'll get more uses out of your existing abilities as well with potential new abilities specifically for the mage. No, we didn't get to level up our in, in the sample adventure. Yeah, so we can't really talk about those mechanics. Now, once you've all got your characters, you're going to decide your marching order, something that felt very old school role playing game like to me. Now, there's a combat grid and character tokens to track this, and you just put them down in the order that you're marching it. Now, many of the things we encountered in our game were affected by who was in front. Now, we didn't see it ourselves, but I assume there's probably going to be other instances where it matters who's in the back or who's in the middle as well. Now, finally, grab the two decks for the adventure you're going to play. There's one encounter deck and one dungeon deck. For us, this was simple as we just got the reviewer sample adventure. Flip up the first dungeon tile, find the matching encounter card, and read it. Now, this card gives you what your objective is. Now, for us and our sample adventure was to find a chest and open it but first we were warned we would have to find three coins before we could get the chest open which i've got to say is a pretty typical dungeon crawl plot and in typical dungeon crawl style you are stuck in a room with a goal and basically nothing else to go on good luck now here's where the game really starts, as it has you exploring the dungeon through cards now each exit lists which card you're going to have to find in place on the table uh, with the color side face up Now, sometimes you get a hint, like it'll say by the door, scratching sounds or digging. Other times you just see a portal door or archway and kind of have to wing it and go through. When you decide as a group which way to go, you're going to draw the appropriate card, dungeon card, take a look at it, because some of the cards you're going to want to look at because they have hints on them to help you deal with whatever you're about to face. You're going to put it down on the, the, the growing map, move your little token that shows where your party is on top of it, Find the matching encounter card from the other deck and read it. What you find will vary wildly. You could find a pile of old rotting furniture, which you can search, or you may enter a room filled with giant bugs. You could find a trap or an unlocked chest just sitting there. Now, in some cases, you just need to do what it says on the card. Maybe you have to take a test, like a skill check to avoid damage from attack a trap you might find something you can search and take the card into your inventory to use later or get the option to use items you've already collected to get past the current challenge some of the items you find let you use them whenever you choose and there were some things we picked up we had to decide whether to use them or not and if we use them who should Mm -hmm. use them like do you put on the fancy necklace you just found or do you drink from the cup of water sitting on the table Now, the results of these things were wonderfully mixed. Now, since this is a sample reviewer adventure, we're not going to spoil anything. So, for example, that cup of water that happened to be sitting on the table, our scout kind of rushed in and chugged it down with a bit of a negative effect. But had we instead let the cleric take a look at it, they could have blessed the water, giving us holy water we could have probably used later. Of course, being based on the fighting fantasy books, a lot of what you will find are monsters you need to defeat in order to move on. The game has a pretty simple combat system. First, enemies and heroes pair off so that everyone is fighting one opponent. Then, if anyone is left on either side, they can back up another character who's in combat. Now, initiative is based on marching order, but that can be changed after the first round of combat. The important part, though, is that first round, you're stuck in the order you've chosen. Each individual skirmish is resolved by an opposed 2d6 roll with one of the non-acting characters rolling for the mobs. 
Both sides add their 2d6 to their skill stat, and then whoever rolled higher does damage equal to the difference between the two totals to the opposing character. Now, heroes can use luck to re-roll both sets of dice, not just yours. you got to re-roll the mobs as well. Something you're going to find you have to do often. In addition to this randomness mitigation, many of the hero skills give bonuses or allow re-rolls or do things like prevent damage completely. Now, remember, each skill can only be used once per encounter. After each round of combat, the next character goes. Characters who are backing up other characters get a bonus to their roll based on how much backup there is total. When the entire party is ganging up on one baddie, the first helper gets one plus one, the second plus two, and the third plus three. Now, while we didn't see it in our sample adventure, it's also possible for the monsters to gang up in the heroes if they outnumber the number of characters. Now, if a character does run out of hit points, they die. They can no longer talk to the other players or give it advice, and they place their character token on the room they died in. Now, the rule book notes there may be a way to bring the character back from the death, dead, but we didn't actually see this option while we played. Now, retreat is also an option after the first combat round, though. You are always obligated to fight at least one round in marching order before you can retreat. After that point, though, you can always just move back to the room you came from, dragging any dead character bodies with you. Any damage on the monsters resets, and they will be full strength when you come back to try again. Now, besides a potential TPK during a fight, your group can also lose in a number of other ways based on the encounter. During our adventure, we saw a bottomless pit, had to sacrifice a hero in order to proceed, and as far as we could tell, that character wasn't going to come back by the end. We could have died due to an imp that was unaffected by normal weapons if we didn't catch it in a net, and eventually ended up all dead at a dead end and starved to death because we found the chest we needed, but only had two of the three coins we needed to open it, and that was past a one-way door. Now, assuming you do better than we did, you should eventually get to an encounter card that tells you that you won which we assume would have happened in our game had we gathered the three coins before heading to the last part of the dungeon that sadly wasn't clearly labeled, hey, if you go past here, you can't come back. So yeah, that's basically it. Start in room number one, choose where to go, find the card, put it on the table, find the matching encounter card, read it and react. Eventually try to accomplish your goal while getting past a variety of obstacles, many of which are going to involve combat. Now, where things get a bit weird is when you lose. While we don't expect cooperative games to be easy, the sometimes sudden and instant ways you can die do bring the game to an abrupt halt, and we weren't really sure what the intention was at that point. So personally, here's where I think you need to look back at the game books this Fighting Fantasy Adventures board game is based, based on. Those were also filled with dead ends and instant death situations. But in those, all players had to do was flip back to the last page they were on and choose another option, which we used to call sticking a thumb in the book because you would leave your thumb on the page you just left so you can go back just in case you messed up. Except this game gives you no place to stick your thumb. Okay, maybe in some cases you could just go back a single room and choose another path, but the way our game ended specifically, there was just no easy way to rewind things. No. It really seemed like the only way was to restart the entire thing and play through it all again. Which would be very different as you would know now a lot of the things that were going to happen and what is to be avoided or gone to first. Yes, because these adventures are not randomized every way. Every time we play through this adventure, we're going to start in the same room one. We're going to hear the same sounds around us. And when we go in the other rooms, the encounters are going to be the same. There is, this is not a roguelike. There is no random generation here whatsoever. Now, I think the intent here is that you would retry. I think when you fail, you're expected to go back and play again. With that knowledge, your group learned the first time, like knowing that the chittering sound is not money clanking. Just like you would go back and keep rereading and replaying a game book until you got to the end. Like, I don't think anyone ever sat down and tried to play Warlock of Firetop Mountain. And after their character died the first time, was like, oh, you got to sell the book. I lost. I don't get to find out what happened. You just started over and tried again. And I think that's what Martin Wallace expects you to do with this game. And with that overview done, it's time to move on to some of our thoughts. So the one thing I think you can tell pretty well from the overview of play is this game does a great job 
of feeling like the classic fighting fantasy game books that it's based on. Fighting Fantasy Adventures has a very old school, early fantasy RPG feel to it. This felt like playing through an old school D&D adventure where you really got that feeling of moving room through room through a dungeon. The card driven system with minimal dice rolling certainly feels like a much more modern game despite its elderly roots and the simplicity of the gameplay made it incredibly easy to get up and playing yeah. with no delays and struggling with rules or having or difficulty understanding anything. Yeah, I've got to admit, this is one of the first games we've reviewed in a long time where I didn't have to grab the rule book once to check anything. And that's impressive. Subtle touches in the game, like listing what you can hear at various doorways and having to pay attention to the actual artwork on the cards added a level of immersion to this game that I wasn't expecting. In addition, acting logically tended to be rewarded and taking silly risks came with a mix of reward and punishment. During our game, we found a good mix of, say, cursed jewelry and magic uh, vorpal swords. And while that cup of water, Sean, really probably shouldn't have drank. Now, that being said, while it may have been a preview issue, we did see conflicting sounds depending on what direction you appro approached a room from. And that was a little odd. But again, this is a preview. Yeah, and that one was weird because it was just one. Out of all the rooms, there was one that they didn't seem to quite match up. Now, the combat system here is really simple and worked really well. It played extremely quicky, quickly and always felt tense, but was very random. Thankfully, they give you that luck skill for rerolls because you are going to need it. And figuring out when best to use your hero skills is a big part of the game. There were some really tough fights in our scenario and things got progressively harder the deeper you went in the dungeon, which is fitting for the theme. Indeed, luck is not something to be hoarded for just the right moment. It should be and will be spread freely as mm -hmm. you progress. I found the entire experience to feel rather nostalgic. And I think that's going to be the big draw of this game for longtime fighting fantasy fans. This is a new way to experience that classic which way style of play that many longtime gamers loved. Now, full disclosure, I wasn't a fan of these books growing up. I didn't have them and I have no fond memories of them. <laughs> Similarly, while I played fantasy games for years, I have drifted away from them to other genres most recently. As a result, while I had fun playing through the dungeon with friends, making mistakes, dealing with bad roles, when the game ended, sort of so did my interest. The idea of doing it all over again because we couldn't go back, even though we knew a lot of the information, just wasn't that interesting to me personally. Fair enough. Whereas I think Deanna and I would have happily sat down and started over right away right then. Now, while I found this new card driven system did a great job of making it feel like classic fighting fantasy adventures, I think the biggest potential problem is that it's a classic fighting fantasy adventure. While having a lot of fantasy RPG tropes and while our personal group is filled with RPG gamers who got into character somewhat, this is not a role playing game. This is very much a dungeon crawling board game with some RPG elements. This is not going to be your next D&D &D alternative. Yeah, at the very basic, you know, this game is a card game with dice. Uh, as shown by the fact that you can solo play the game, role play is purely for those at the table, not for the game itself. Yeah, there was definitely, there was an encounter where we could solve it by talking. But there was no actual having to decide what you said, for example. There is none of that here. There is no game master. There is no arbitration. Everything is just very clearly presented and you make your choice. There were some interesting ways they did the mechanic where you made your choice, then flipped the card to see what happened. And I thought that was well done, but there was no arbiter here. Overall, this game is, is very clearly made for fans of fighting fantasy game books. And I think it does an awesome job of updating those to a more modern card driven board game format. You really do get the feel of playing one of those classic adventures with all the old school dungeon crawling tropes along with it. If you are fans of those books, you really should check out this new fighting fantasy game out as a fan of the books myself. I really enjoyed this new version. Yeah, this is the real takeaway for listeners. This product 
drips with history and memories for those who are of a certain age, or perhaps even got them from their parents. It is a callback to a different era, but packaged in a modern system. Now, if you're an old school role player looking for a board game that gives you the OSR feel, something you usually don't find in modern dungeon crawlers like Gloomhaven and Too Many Bones or about as far away from the OSR as possible, you might want to give Final Fantasy Adventures a shot. This could be the perfect thing to play when you're short a player or your GM's on vacation for your regular game night. It's definitely much quicker to get to the table and start playing than most tabletop role-playing games. Yep. Give your GM a night off. There is no prep required for this crawl. Now, if you are a fan of those more modern dungeon crawlers, like I just mentioned, or more modern RPGs, this may not be a game for you. It really depends on how much you enjoy randomness in your games and how well you and your group take things like instant death based on nearly arbitrary choices or just losing due to a bunch of bad die rolls in a row. This isn't the kind of role-playing game where it's all about experiencing the story, and you're expected to reach the end no matter how bad things go along the way. This is a competitive game, even though it's you and your friends versus the adventure. It's a card game designed specifically to please fans of this series of Witchway books, and I think it does that very well. But it belongs soundly on the side of board games, not RPGs. Now, here's an interesting one talking about board games is if you enjoy Tragedy Looper or even more so the time traveling puzzle games in the Time Story series, or if you're a fan of Souls like video games, you may just love this board game. This is due to the fact that an aspect of fighting fantasy adventures is failing and trying a mission again and using what you learned on the last run to help you get further the next time. Well, that's it for our preview of Fighting Fantasy Adventures, a new take on the classic Fighting Fantasy game books by Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson, reimagined by Hall of Fame game designer Martin Wallace. Now, does this game have you hyped as much as it has me hyped? I loved the various game books that came out during my childhood, and I played many of them. And I thought it was awesome to be able to recreate that feel with a group of my friends nowadays. What game books did you grow up playing? Tell us all about it in the comments below. If you did enjoy this preview, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Welcome to our review of the deluxe edition of the cooperative word building game Illiterati from Gap Closer Games, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy. Literati was designed by the team of Gary Alka, Rob Chu, and John Kang. Features some rather striking artwork from Audrey Young. This word game was originally funded on Kickstarter back in March of 2022, and now that copies have been shipped to all backers, it's available in retail in both a standard and a deluxe edition. It's the deluxe version that we're reviewing here today. This version of the game includes some aesthetic upgrades, which we will detail later, but no additional rules or in-game content. Now, Literati is a simultaneous play timed game It plays one to five players, with most games taking well under an hour. The more players you add, the longer the game gets. It's listed as age seven plus, and honestly, the age limit for this is going to be based on how big a vocabulary and how good your kid's spelling is. Though, as a cooperative game, parents can certainly help their young ones to some degree. In Illiterati, you, the players, are members of the League of Librarians who have banded together to save the world's books from the evil illiterati, a group of elites who wish to keep reading to their own exclusive group while making the rest of the population illiterate. You do this by collecting letters and grouping them into words and using those words to bind new books. The goal is for each player to bind a set number of books and then as a team complete one final chapter. The catch is that you're on a time limit and the illiterati are after you. After each round, any letters not used are burned, and one member of the illiterati will catch up to you, causing the group to discard letters or even whole words. Can you heroes manage to find a final volume before too many books are burned? For a look at the great-looking components and special box you get with the deluxe edition of illiterati, check out our unboxing on YouTube. There you will see the unique sleeve style box, Mm -hmm. the upgraded screen printed wooden letter tiles, the two embroidered bags, 
a jewel capped hourglass, the dual layer burn tracker, the five bookmarks, some promo cards for Gap Closer games, and other game rival restaurants, and all of the non deluxe components, like three sets of oversized cards, red books, blue books, and cards for the literati themselves. A really solid box insert that does a great job of keeping these cards in place and one of the better rule books we've ever read. And my only issue here, which you can see in the unboxing video, is that the deluxe jewel capped hourglass doesn't work very well. Now, the jewel top and bottom actually have a very small surface area and it's prone to getting knocked over. But worse than that, even when standing up, we found the sand sometimes gets caught and it stops. Now, this problem comes and goes. Some rounds, it's perfectly fine. Others, you're going to have to give it a little tap on the table. Or perhaps, better yet, just use a timer on someone's mobile device. Now, I'm also slightly concerned about the pull ribbon used to open the box. So far, it's holding up fine, but I always feel like it's taking a lot of force to get that box open. Now, while I had reasonable luck with a firm tap on the table with the hourglass when turning it over, once you don't trust it, it's hard to ever trust it again. But with that, let's move on to an overview of play. So start a game of the Lotterati with all the letter tiles in one bag. Give five out to each player. Then everyone's dealt a red book card. This goes face up in front of them. You then draw three tiles and put them in the center of the table, forming the library. You're then ready to start the first round. Each round in a Lotterati starts with the players drawing seven tiles. Yes, even after you already have five. Once everyone has their new tiles, the three minute timer is started and players start trying to form words out of all their letters. These words can be pretty much anything, must be at least three letters long and can't be proper nouns unless they fit the theme of the book card in front of the player. Each player can only have a maximum of eight words. Now, while building words, players are free to talk to each other, discuss the words they're working on, and even trade letters and or full words between each other. Players can also freely exchange letters with the library in the center of the table, but need to be aware it can only hold three by the end of the round. The main goal, especially in the first round, is just to make sure to use up all of your letters. Mm -hmm. That's how you stay alive in this game and prevent books from getting burned. Only once you have your words should you start worrying about binding books. Now, binding books is the goal of the game. The book card in front of each player lists the requirements for that book to be bound. For the red books, at the start of the game, all you're looking for is at least eight letters worth of words. No eight letters worth of words, which could be multiple words. You're not looking for one eight letter long word, though that would count as well. All of these have to fit the same theme. Now, themes include things like animals or things found under the sea or tech and social media companies. In addition, you're going to require at least three of the letters in your binding words to come from the same, I guess we'll call it suit. There are four suits or themes in Literati which represent different types of book. Drama, conflict, tragedy, and adventure. Mechanically, this means some of the letters all of the vowels and some of the consonants come in these suits, which are each represented by a different color and symbol. In addition to this, there are a number of black tiles, which count as any suit. These include two blank wild cards and a number of hard to use letters like X, Q, and Z. Once the timer runs out, you first check to make sure everyone has used all their letters. If anyone has extra letters left over once the timer stops, they have to put them in the library at the center of the table. You then check the library to see if it has more than three letter tiles in it. If it does, you failed. The illiterati caught you and you have to run away. One random letter from the library is burned. Any remaining extras are discarded. If this is your fourth burned letter, the game is over and you have lost. If you didn't have to burn a letter, each player can attempt to bind a book. They discard letters matching their book's requirements and discard the fulfilled book card. When you discard your starter red book, your next book comes from the blue pile, which generally have harder requirements based on grammatical forms and concepts and not word groups. Things mm -hmm. like rhyming words, synonyms, antonyms. Now, once you bind a blue book, you must wait until all other players have also bound a blue book. And at that point, the group picks one more book type to bind, either blue or red. One book card is revealed. This is the final chapter. 
the final book that needs to be bound by every player at once on the same round. If the players manage to do this, they win. Now note, every player has to be able to bind that book at the same time. That is something we messed up on our first couple of plays. Once we figured that out, the game got much harder. Now at this point, after you've either burned a book or bound a book, or just managed to survive the round by using all your letters, a member of the Illiterati gets involved. You draw one card from the Illiterati deck and carry out what it says on the card. Now, these are all nasty things that usually make you discard letters from your already formed words, ruining them for the next round. These include things like everyone discarding their smallest word unless the player with the largest word in play discards that. Drawing a tile from the bag and everyone discarding every instance of that letter in play. Or checking how many letters of a specific theme you have and then discarding letters based on that count. The important thing here is none of it is good. To make things even nastier, there are five different illiterati persons in the deck, and each has their own form of punishment. If you ever draw a new illiterati card that matches a person that's already in play, there is a chain effect where the new card takes effect, and then each existing instance of that same illiterati goes off in what is usually a pretty deadly combination. Now, assuming you haven't burned your fourth letter or lost and lost or bound the final chapter and won, play moves to the next round. Everyone gets seven new letters, the timer's restarted, and you all start forming words again. The big thing to watch for here is to focus on making sure that everyone has used all of their letters by the end of the round, and that no one has accidentally made more than eight words. While bookbinding is the goal of the game and how you win, that can't be at the cost of burning books. When you burn books, not only do you get closer to losing the game, you also don't get a chance to bind books that round. And don't forget, you're adding more literati to the mix, whether you bind books or not. Now, in addition to these basic rules, literati also comes with rules for solo play and ways to increase the difficulty level. These involve having to bind more than two books before reaching the final chapter, a smaller library, and less allowed to burn books before a loss. There is also an optional win condition where you can't bind the final chapter if there are any letters left in the library. The library's got to be empty so you leave no trace. Now this word game, while not easy by any means, does a lot to balance the gaps between different people's word skills. Yeah, we agreed to check out this word game from Gap Closer Games because my family, in my family, my wife, Deanna, in particular, loves word games. My oldest daughter, Gwen, also has shown a lot of love for them. Now, me personally, I'm not a huge fan because the girls always taunt me. So the idea of a cooperative world word game really appealed to me, and I was hyped to check out Illiterati, and I was not disappointed in the least. Having the ability to help and not hinder your family members, be they more or less verbose than you, is really the shining aspect of this game. Mm. The cooperation around the table was a delight. As while there are other cooperative word games out there, few, if any, let you help each other with the word, your own words in this way. Illiterati really is not just a good word game. It's also a good cooperative game. And it has a very appealing theme that I think is going to appeal to a lot of non-hobby gamers. Like Who doesn't want to become a badass librarian trying to stop fascists and tent on world illiteracy by binding books out of scraps? Like, how cool a theme is that? Anything to stop the book burners is something I didn't think I'd have to say in 2023. At its heart, Illiterati is a pretty simple game. It's kind of like cooperative bananagrams. You get a pile of letters and try to form words as quickly as you can. The twist, of course, being that other people can help and you can help other people out. I don't think you could play this game as multiplayer solitaire. I think it'd just be way too hard to use up all the letters that you were dealt randomly every round. To win this game, you are going to have to cooperate. And it's more than just helping spell words. It's easy to lose track and have too many words in front of you, or have some spare letters that you thought you were going to use, but are going to end up in the library, causing you to burn letters. While this can lead to some quarterbacking, with people yelling out things like, oh, spell this, or how about you try that, or give me that K, I need it, We always found it to be under control and never overbearing or forceful. In general, the quarterbacking here is more about trying to help out someone who's short on time 
and not one player trying to lead the others because they know the game better or think they're better at it. And one of the good aspects of quarterbacking is helping someone who has a book they simply don't understand or perhaps have misread it and are building words for a different or incorrect concept from yeah. what their book requires. Now, I do love the component quality in Arati, Illiterati. Wow, I'm losing the word again. I do love the component quality in Illiterati, and I'm glad they sent us the deluxe edition. I admit it. I don't know if I would enjoy playing this as much with thinner chipboard letter tiles after playing with a nice thick wood version. I also adore the fact the game with game with two bags instead of one of all the silly things. This is something I never really thought of before. And it's something I think I'm going to need to do to all my bag pulling games like Azul. Instead of having to dump all the discarded tiles just onto the table and then having to dump them in the bag when empty, you just discard into the second bag. First one runs out, whoop, switch to the other bag. That's it. I love it. It's amusing how much difference the two bag system makes. Sometimes yeah. it's just the little things. Now, another thing that impressed me here is the price point. The standard edition of this game is only 35 US, 47 Canadian, with the deluxe coming in at only 49 US or 66 Canadian. I gotta say, under 50 US is a great price for what you get in the deluxe edition, and under 35 is just a great price for a modern board game, especially one with chipboard tiles, a box insert, and oversized Dixit size cards. Now, we don't comment often on prices for games, they are what they are. But this one really is kind of shockingly well-priced in the current market. Now, if you're a word game fan, I think Illiterati is a no-brainer. This is just a great modern word game with a cooperative twist. The entire system for staying, staying alive by using all of your letters, combined with the fact you're trying to form words that fit specific categories, is refreshing and feels new. I think that's even more the case if you have kids of suitable ages who enjoy words and language because this is a great family experience. Now, if you're looking for a cooperative game that's not about exploring dungeons, surviving an alien attack, curing diseases, or sinking islands, I think you should give Illiterati a look. It's a unique theme for a cooperative game, and there really aren't a lot of cooperative word games out there. The basic mechanics also make this one good for groups of non-gamers, as cooperative Scrabble, where you're trying to defeat the evil Illiterati, is a pretty easy sell. The number of books to be bound makes it solid for replayability, yes. even if it had been priced notably higher. Now, what impressed me the most, though, is the fact that this game may just appeal to players who aren't generally big word game fans. Gamers like me. I don't mind your average word game, but they're not my style of game, and it's not something I'm going to go to by choice very often. The thing is, Illiterati sucked me in with its cool theme and cooperative play. In this game, the fact my wife is a huge book nerd didn't make the game one-sided. It just made the game easier for our entire team. But this game isn't for everyone. In fact, it has two main drawbacks, which can come into play for some groups that you need to be conscientious of. Yeah, a firm grasp of spelling is required to play this game, and it's going to make that alone is going to make it a no-go for some players specifically players with learning disabilities like my daughter. This is also a real-time game, and despite it being cooperative, you're on a timer, and that can be an anxiety issue for some players. Due to this, Literati is a game I can never play together with the whole family. Despite Genevieve, my youngest, absolutely loving the theme, this is a game she is just not able to play. Well, that's it for our review of Illiterati, a cooperative word game with a fantastic theme. Do you enjoy word games? What's your favorite? Is it the classic Scrabble or something more modern? Let us know about it in the comments or tell Moa about it at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Get a better look at Illiterati through my written review, which will be live soon, if it's not up already, over at tabletopbellhop.com. Next up, a short, spoiler-free look at the second game in the Holiday Hijinks series. The Independence Incident, a super tiny escape room in a box experience from friends of the show Grand Gamers Guild, who we have to thank for handing over a review copy of this card game. So the Independence Incident was designed by Jonathan Chafer, who also did all the artwork and graphic design for the game. Great job, Jonathan. It's designed for one to four players and is a timed puzzle experience with the best score requiring you to beat it in under an hour. This is the second of a series of 18-card 
puzzle games, each with a holiday theme, all published by Grand Gamers Guild. Now, this particular experience was published in 2021. There is no age limit listed on these games, and the content is family-friendly. Due to the theme of this particular holiday hijinks game, the 4th of July, knowledge of American history will help a lot, but it's not necessary. All of the information required to solve the puzzles here can be found on the game's web page, which is required to use in order to even play the game. Now, the way this system works and works with only 18 cards is due to the fact it's web driven. Now, there's no app to download, but you do get a QR code to send scan, which brings you to a page which lists all the games in the series and you just pick which game you're playing. As this is a puzzle experience that can only be played once, we didn't bother to do an unboxing video. Really, there isn't that much to see either. The Independence Incident comes in a small four-fold card holder that has instructions in it and a stack of 18 double-sided cards, which you shouldn't look through. Yeah, component-wise, there's not a lot to talk about. I do dig just how small these holiday hijinks games are, like you could almost fit this in your wallet. And the pack they come in is resealable, you also don't destroy anything while playing, so you can easily just pack it back up and pass the card pack on to someone else when you're done. As for how to play, you discover this as you go along, but the general premise is flip over card one and it presents a puzzle. You solve the puzzle as a group and then go onto the web and enter your answer. If you're right, it will tell you to draw another card, which will contain the next puzzle, and so on. Some puzzles are bigger and you will draw more than just one card, and at some point, you will need to use all the cards together. Now, the cards end up telling a story. It was a rather national treasure type of story based, of course, around American history, historical artifacts, and the 4th of July. Many of the puzzles will test your knowledge of American history. And for those of you who aren't brushed up on the Founding Fathers, all of the information you need can actually be found on the game's webpage. In addition, it is a highly detailed step-by-step -step clue system similar to what we've seen in other escape room style games. Initial hints, just making sure you have what you need on hand, with each progressive hint giving more and more information and the ability to just look at the solution. This is all done on a card number basis. So you continue solving puzzle after puzzle until you get to the final solution. Then you're given a score out of five based on how long you took and how many clues you used. At that point, you can compare your score with others who played the game, pack it back up, and give it to someone else to go through. So you played this with the kids and Dee's extended family. How mm -hmm. did it go as a bunch of Canadians playing a July 4th based game? Well, so it was better and worse than I thought it would be all at once. So it was worse in the fact that the puzzles here really are American history based puzzles. Um, all of them were American history based. It wasn't like uh, you were just solving logic puzzles that happened to have American history in them. And like this required you to know things like popular American patriotic songs. Now, even as someone who grew up just south of Detroit with American TV through most of my childhood, my American knowledge was sadly lacking as far as this particular puzzle was concerned. Now, better though, like the, the better than I expected side of this though, was that all of the information I needed was easily accessible on the game's page and easy to find. So when you figure out what you're looking for, at it must be an american patriotic song you can then go through the list of american patriotic songs and figure out what to do next for example now the nice thing about this is that everything was there in one place it's not like we had to randomly google stuff to try to solve any answers which is something similar escape puzzles have had us do indeed while it may seem a bit like cheating having all the information present 247 years of history is a lot to just google through so having a bit of context makes a big difference. Now, in the end, we got a score of 4.5 out of 5, which I got to say is pretty good for a group of Canadians. Now, we did have to use a couple clues, and we did go over the one-hour time limit by about 30 minutes. So that was, that was the most shocking part. Now, I will say, though, most of that time was spent doing research on the game's webpage. Now, I think someone born and raised in the U.S. probably would have blown past some of the puzzles that required some research for us. Though, depending on your history education, your mileage may vary. 
Now, before some final thoughts, I do want to bring up player count. Now, I noticed when I looked up this game on Board Game Geek that it lists as one to four players. I didn't see anything on the packaging indicating that, so I'm not sure where the official player count is, but we played with five, and I got to say that felt like too much. The puzzles here are presented in a linear order. You are flipping card one, you are solving the puzzle on card one, then you're flipping, say, card two. Though if I remember, they didn't go in order. You jumped around a bit so that, you know, to make sure you're not spoiling anything by seeing the back of a card. Um, There wasn't really anything where everyone could work on their own puzzle at once. We were all trying to solve the same thing. And I think five heads was a bit much for that, especially with the people ever wanting to see the card. Can I see it? Can I see it? Can I see it? Was It was a bit of an issue. I think the sweet spot here would be at least two players because in, as, as most of the escape room games, you want two different points of view and two, two different sets of eyes looking at your puzzles to get through them. And maybe a third set of eyes, like a third person in there to also help out and provide another perspective. I think past that, you're going to have players sitting out on various aspects of the puzzles. Now, unlike larger puzzles we've reviewed, there's just not enough material to spread around and work on in parallel. It's one puzzle at a time on small playing cards. Overall, though, this was a very solid puzzle experience. Despite having a rating of three out of three for difficulty, we never felt completely lost and we never had to look up an answer. We did use a couple clues, which I have to say made us feel rather smart, especially as Canadians doing a game made for Americans. I was especially impressed by how much puzzle was packed in this small pack of 18 cards like you only have 18 cards here and i felt i got as much if not more experience out of this than i have in larger big box escape room games it cost triple the cost of this game though with this format you're not getting all those fun knickknacks and fancy aspects of papers and menus Mm -hmm. and other things that you get in the larger escape room boxes yeah very true This game, and really the rest of the game in the series, also have the added bonus of being rather thematic, right? This game was bleeding American history. The games are tied to many different holidays at this point, and to me, this makes them the perfect game to, of course, play on the appropriate day. What better way to celebrate U.S. Independence Day as a Canadian than to play an escape room game? Come on. And, well, if you are from the U.S., this would be a perfect distraction after eating too many burgers and hot dogs when you need to sit down for a bit after the family barbecue. Of course, if you've been imbibing adult beverages for the holiday, you might want to let someone else take the lead on solving puzzles. Now, if you're a puzzle game fan, I can't see any reason not to pick up at least some of the games in the series. While I can see other Canadians skipping this one in particular... Um, I think most people are going to enjoy a short escape room experience after trick-or-treating or on someone's birthday. And with so far seven different ones to choose from, if they all remain engage- as engaging as this one, there should be at least one for everyone. Now, while these games have a very reasonable price of only 11 bucks each, you can get them even cheaper if you're willing to print your own copies. And I gotta say, it's not often a publisher offers print-and-play versions of their games, But I think an 18-card escape room game is pretty much the perfect format for a print-and-play file, even one I'm willing to spend the ink on. The games are half price if you decide to go with the print-and-play option. Well, that's it for our spoiler-free look at The Independence Incident, the second game in Grand Gamer Guild's Holiday Hijinks line. We love the fact that more publishers are putting out holiday-themed games, as we can't think of better ways to spend a holiday than gaming with friends or family. What's your favorite holiday-themed game? Or perhaps a game that isn't holiday-themed, but that you play every year together to celebrate. Get a bit more of a look, still spoiler-free, of this 18-card escape room game over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com through my written review. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so I don't, these are mostly in timeline order, but may not be perfect. So first off was a game night with the kids in Deanna. We don't do those as often as we should. As, as a gamer, as a family full of gamers, my kids are often distracted by technology and other things going on. And we don't actually sit down and play games with them as often as I'd like. So the other day we we spent a family game night together, starting off with the game Reality Shift um specifically reality shift deluxe because that's what we brought back from origins this is a game from um academy games 
and, and a really odd one for them because they're usually very historic, like teacher copy versions of board games. And here they made this m- weird sci-fi racing game. Now I'm saying Reality Shift Deluxe because that's the version we bought, but we actually just played Reality Shift because we didn't use any of the stuff that came with the Deluxe Edition, which is basically an expansion. So Reality Shift is is we just stuck to the base rules. We played five games. And for anyone who hasn't seen my pictures I've shared on this, and I don't think we've talked about it on the show much, except for in our Origins recap, we talked about a demo. You have nine cubes that are that are like 3D cubes, like giant D6s that have um, maps on them. And it's a race where you're trying to get your light cycle from the start cube to the, the, the goal cube, a specific spot on it. And you're rolling dice to see how far you move, and then you can play cards to move further or turn around. But the big thing is, is you are hackers who can hack the racing grid, and you can do things to these cubes, like rotate them, shift them, and flip them over and stuff. Very interesting, cool-looking, very tactile game. One of the interesting things about this game is uh, you have to make a path from the start to the end. Uh, when mm-hmm. you start the game, there may not be a actual route to get from start to finish. Uh, it's all a part of hacking the, the game to stop others and gain your own path to that finish. Now, what was interesting to me on this one that was a very different experience from our demo games is the first two games we played were over before every player got a turn, which to me is an absolutely horrible thing happen in any game ever made and really started to turn me off on the game and it wasn't until the third fourth and fifth games that we started to realize that you need to play this defensively and try to stop others from winning rather than just try to make the shortest route to the end so you can win so it ends up if you try to win too easily easy, like if you're trying right from the beginning to you know make a route to the goal as quick as possible all you're doing is opening up a path for the later players which was an interesting discovery and something i think i'm going to try to make sure we call out during the review that <laughs> don't yeah. try to make it too easy because if you do you just like like i said players didn't even get a turn well, and, and even I think our- ev- even in our later games, uh, you know, you have to be very conscientious of, OK, I need this path to get to there. But is there a way I can do it without opening up a similar path yes. for another player? Um, yeah. And and that's, it, you know, there, there's a whole lot of sort of 4D chess thinking going on mm-hmm. in this. And I think that's required to actually enjoy the game, because if you just kind of and also if you just kind of silly and move things around willy-nilly which my youngest daughter likes to do which all the power to her it's a, it's a nice quick fast game most of the time so i don't mind it but you are probably going to do someone to help someone else more than you're going to help yourself next up was psycho babble uh, the game we shouldn't have brought home from origins um we were at the outset games now i feel terrible what is the publisher the outset to have these organized these are the games we played the games we mentioned during the Ask the Bellhop. I think it's outside. Yes, outside games. Outside games, Psycho Babble. We were there and did a demo of a different game, one we haven't played yet. So I'm not even going to talk about that game. And the the head of the company or whoever whoever did the demo was obviously someone important with Outset. May have been the CEO. I have no idea. It might have been the designer of the game. Was like, no, you have to try this other game. And here he showed us this game with a bunch of funky cards on it. And it's a social deduction game. And anyone who's listened to the show for any amount of time knows I am not a social deduction game fan. For the fact that I would almost say I hate social deduction games, but there are always exceptions. Um, one of the big ones being Battlestar Galactica. I adore that game. Shadows over Camelot is another one. Well, here is another one I like. The thing is, in this game, is it's social deduction where lying isn't encouraged and often doesn't help. But more importantly, there's no blame or bad feelings. There's no the, why'd you pick me as the werewolf? Or why do you think I'm lying? None of that was part of this game. I loved the fact that, that I don't know, it was blameless social deduction. Like, like what you were doing in this game never, it didn't, there were no negative experiences. There was no bad side to it. Now, yeah. we also played this one later in the weekend with both the kids and Sean joining in so what did you think of psychobabble well i think the first thing that we should we should point out is there are some 
potentially problematic aspects to this. Yes, true. Uh, this is a game about psychotherapy uh, that discusses uh, some, you know, concepts of, you know, insanity that may not make everyone comfortable. And I think we should just definitely just call that out straight up. Yes. But now note, note it's not about real psychotherapy. Right. This is a Cthulhu game. This is, this this is, is a very much game yes. where this people is, are, are very much a, uh, a, a wacky, you know, the, the elders are invading your head yes. sort of thing. But this, this isn't voices exist. in your head or uh, the, the interesting thing about this is there are three roles that the players take on mm -hmm. and two of them, uh, are the same. Like if there's the psychotherapist, which is an established role, but there's also an imposter somewhere in the, uh, in the group, but they don't know. Yes. Uh, none of the players know whether they are the imposters or not, uh, until or unless it comes out during the questioning portions of the game and the information portions of the game. And that's what really makes this a, a sort mm -hmm. of step above and, and the neck and makes this, uh, comfortable for Mo and, and, and fun. Um, because the, you're, you're working with some great surreal art. Uh, the art on the cards is fantastic. Oh, yeah. They've done a, a really amazing job creating, um, uh, panoramas, no matter yeah. which cards are involved. So there's four or five, five, four sweet suits of cards. And no matter which of those cards you put next to each other, it makes a panorama which is fantastic uh, from a game design perspective. And, yeah. and, and, and <laughs> I think you have to be surreal in order to do that. It just wouldn't, wouldn't yeah, work true. otherwise. But again, I, as also someone who doesn't really enjoy social deduction games, this game was really fun. And I am now looking forward to playing this at public events and acting mm -hmm. as the sort of moderator, the psychotherapist role at public play events with larger groups this mm -hmm. plays up to 11 and yeah. I'm really interested in seeing what comes of the large group play of this game, because it was really interesting at five. Uh, and yeah. I feel like 11 could be a even more interesting game. It may break. I don't know, but it's got potential either way. Yeah. We're still discovering this one. Um, I think I'm already past five plays, which is our usual benchmark for a review. But what I really need to do with this game is try it with different groups. So anyone who's local in Windsor, I will be bringing this out on Saturday to our next barbershop bar event. I think it's a perfect venue for this particular game. I think it's also going to work well with people possibly imbibing adult beverages, <laughs> but I also think it'll work for like any younger people in the group as well. Any of the families who show up, this is not really an age limited game and which is fascinating for the theme. Like, like I, I don't can't think of many Cthulhu games. I'd happily play with my kids even when they were younger. And I see no reason not to in this. And speaking of the, the graphic design, one of the other things I absolutely adore about this is how they manage to repeat themes over multiple cards, which is required for the game to work. No, this is, this is fantastic. Uh, they say age is 10 plus. Um, and that's probably about the right age for depending on, you know, depending on various levels of, of your children's development, yeah. uh, in order to, to get the concepts of, yeah. of, you know, what's going on, um, that 10 is probably about right. Some kids might be able to handle it a bit younger, but a good guideline I think is 10 for this one. Yeah, I can see that. We did a terrible job of explaining what the game was this particular time, but that's all right. That's this what, wasn't that's a review. what we're here for. We played it. It was fun and it was <laughs> confusing Cthulhu stuff. All right. Next up, uh, sticking with games played with Sean involved is Boop. I taught Sean how to play Boop. This is an abstract cat placing game. If you were here earlier for our Ask the Bellhop segment, we described the game a bit with its art aspect, but this is a, a, a very chess-like game that it happens to involve cats um big props to clay from from uh smirk and laughter games for coming up with this fantastically appealing theme um in boop you have a grid and you are placing kittens on the grid and the thing is that when a kitten ends up next to another kitten it boops all the kittens around them and they move one square away you're going to keep doing this until you make a string of three kittens in your your color then they upgrade to cats now you are putting through 
cats onto the board as well as kittens, trying to make a row of three cats. Now, cats are bigger than kittens, so can't be booped by kittens. So you get this like two layers of play going on there. I really neat abstract strategy game with, with one of the cutest themes I've ever seen. Yeah, no, Boop, Boop is adorable. And again, as we discussed in the uh, in the ask earlier on, it's just really well uh, graphically designed um, that makes it a super fun play, even though it's basically a completely abstract, completely, uh, <laughs> completely, you know, discs on a discs on a chessboard type game. Yeah. Now, I followed up Boop with Shobu, which I think is fitting. So I had no idea about this while we were at the con. I have wanted a copy. I brought both these games back from Origins, FYI, um, both from Smirk and Dagger. So thank you for letting us take those home play. Um, I had no clue that they, they were related. So Shobu is an abstract strategy game I have wanted since I heard the first discre- like podcasters talking about it going, oh, you do this, you do a non-aggressive move, then an aggressive move, and you're trying to do this. I'm like, that sounds awesome. I need to get this game. But no one local had it. Um, and then we went through a pandemic and all this other mess that was going on. So I have wanted Shobu forever. Now, what I didn't know until getting both games in my hands is that Boop is a follow-up to Shobu by the same designer. It's actually the next step. So I thought that was kind of funny. It is the official follow-up to Shobu. Now, while the games are slightly similar, they do play quite different. Now, I will say I prefer Shobu. Shobu is a game where you put rocks out on a grid. You have a four by four grid, four of them. Um, I might have described this already last episode, so I'm going to do it really quick. But you're going to make a move on a, a board, and it's move any piece, any direction, two squares. Then you have to make a matching move on a second board that's a different color. And the whole thing is your first move is passive. All you can do is move. You can't push anyone. You can't bump into anything. You have to have open space to move. But your second move is aggressive, and that can push your you or your opponent's stones around on the board. And the goal is to push all the opponent's stones off one of the four boards. And I am so glad I picked up both these games because I like Boop. Boop is cool, but I like Shobu even better. Now, this was your first time playing Shobu. What did you think of that one? So I I definitely preferred Shobu. Um, Shobu is is the better game. And and as I look at them, they aren't the same designer at all. Not even close. Well, then why is one say it's the (laughs) follow-up to Shobu? Uh, well, it may be Smirk and Dagger's follow up to Shobu, but because they're both okay. Smirk and Dagger games. But Scott Brady the... is the designer of Boop, and Shobu is designed by Jamie Sajdak and Manolis Varanis. Okay, I'm, I'll <laughs> have to do some more research before so we officially yeah, review good thing. this. We one. haven't reviewed this yet. We're, all, we're just talking out our butts. But uh, uh, according to Board Game Geek, at least, these are very much not the same designer, mm-hmm. they are the same publisher. However, yeah, maybe the publisher has decided, uh, but no, Shobu is fantastic. It is. I mean, I, everything about Shobu screams. I am an ancient Chinese or ancient, you know, an ancient abstract game that was played on the sands of uh, the top of the temple or something like that. It says um, from the makers of Shobu. Yeah. Which I we're, guess just smirk and dagger or smirk and laughter. Yeah, I, the makers, not the designer. Meant, yeah. Okay. Um, but no, Shobu, Shobu is that fantastic uh, design and that, that idea of a passive and an active move uh, I, with each turn uh, really worked for me. Um, and I would be happy to play Shobu again. So next up is some Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Um, first time using the At The Ready expansion. Now, before anyone yells here, we did get an early copy of this at Origins, thanks to our friends at the Op. This expansion is not available yet and will not be available until Gen Con. So thank you, Op, for the sneak peek. So this is our first time using this expansion, and um, it's similar to the others. It's it's another three characters. Interestingly, no other new rules, except for the, the constant abilities, which ever since the first expansion has been part of the game. You got no new tokens, no new terrain tiles, no funky new status counters. Everything's just three new characters with their own 10-card decks and their own abilities. Now, this is our first game using it. So what I let us do this time is I wanted to see all three characters. So I let Sean have the three expansion characters. And then I picked three characters. I can't remember what I decided to try. But I picked characters from the other expansions in the base game. Now, I got to say, after that game, I'm not sure this is a great set to play with those three characters altogether. 
Now, to be fair, I did completely mis- misunderstand a Mrs. Potts rule, uh, yeah. which would have drastically changed things. But I, I still also think that they aren't necessarily the ideal team to uh, to play together. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and to be fair, it's not like the other sets have all worked great together, though. I, I Turning the Tide seemed like those three characters in particular worked well together, but just because they had the same theme, right? Um, the second game though we played, we just drafted characters um, with with an eye to use some of the new characters. So I wanted to try Mrs. Potts, and I got to say I loved the fact her cards were good for boosting others. So her big thing is that if you discard her cards on any player's turn, you get something. And I thought that was neat. That that I think that is to fit the theme of pouring out the tea, right? She's a teapot, and it's like you, you get something by actually using up her cards. I thought that was really neat, and it worked really well. Whereas I decided, uh, after playing with Robin Hood specifically, I wanted to see how that how his great ranged attacks could combo up with other players. So I ended up going with a ranged. Uh, two ranged in a tank. I went with Robin Hood, uh, Buzz Lightyear, and Sully uh, as my tank. And mm-hmm. I think this actually worked out really well because yeah. both Robin and uh, Buzz are great sort of board control, area control shooters that you can use, you know, split them up across the board and use to narrow down the options of where your opponent wants to be. Yep. While at the same time charging in with Sully and you know soaking some damage and bashing people around, um, and I, I was really impressed with how well uh, that, especially just the the two shooters with Robin and Buzz worked t- together. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember. I did Doctor Fusilier with Mickey, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey. So far, the only Mickey, but Sorcerer's <laughs> Apprentice Mickey and Mrs. Potts. And I've got to say, some of the deck control stuff that was going on there worked really well together. Um, Mrs. Potts' ability to getting to draw extra cards and look at them to move people. Mm-hmm. And I got to say, the second game was so close. Now, the first game was very lopsided. Yeah. But again, it, it, I, I I screwed up a rule that I think probably would have brought it back into proximity. Yes. <laughs> Whereas the second game where we both drafted and main teams we thought would work well together was definitely a much better game overall. And, and, and I gotta generally, say, that's how we found Sorcerer's Arena to be. If yeah. you if you think about the teams you're building, the games generally end up being pretty close, and yeah. you know the the advantage goes to the one who just played a little better, basically, because there's no randomness yep. involved other than the card draw. Well, the card draw can matter a lot. <laughs> that whole I don't have a single movement card can definitely be well, an issue. Yes, that's, <laughs> there was that. <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, I think there's a, there's more randomness than some other card games, but. No, I'm digging it. Um, so far, I still have to try Robin Hood and Mulan to see how they turn out. Mulan just seemed like okay, and from what I saw, like like not great, not terrible, just like kind of middle ground damage dealing character. Yeah, but, but she's I a didn't princess, and there could possibly be some uh, some princess benefits uh, yeah. to be had with uh, with with combos that way. So. All right, uh, next, I probably should have just threw this in with when we were talking about earlier, but Reality Shift, we played four-player, then three-player. Um, this is when Sean first got to play a full game, and I know you shared some thoughts earlier, but do you have any more to say yeah, on I Reality mean, Shift? When we demoed this at uh, at the con, I was intrigued. It was neat. The components are fantastic. They're really eye-catching. It's a mm-hmm. huge table presence game. But, I, and, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't really feel it was for me. It was, it was interesting, but, yeah, whatever. But then when we played it with more than two players, Mm -hmm. um, I found it really interesting and thought provoking. Um, I I don't know if I ever would have been interested in playing it two player again, (laughs) but when you had the, the number of combinations and and things happening on the board with extra players with three or more players, it really became more interesting. uh, And I'm really looking forward to uh to seeing what some of the other act expansions do to it as well because again as as just a two-player game it was kind of like yeah you know it's gonna happen but you're still gonna get somebody's gonna get there reasonably quickly yeah. um whereas as soon as you add that third person in it's all you know and they're and they're playing defensively as we mentioned earlier yes. um 
you know, there's a whole lot more thought and involved and you're, you're, you're working on, you know, all right, can I rotate this, that, and this and that, and, you know, there's, there's being able to pass the, pass the board around and spin it around in front of you to mm -hmm. examine the, uh, what was going on, uh, really raised it up a level from what I felt, I felt I'd saw it, I'd seen at the demo. Yeah, I think this was one of those where I, I saw the potential more than you did when I first did the demo. I was like, oh, no, this plus like I, for me, I run public play events. This is going to get people's attention. I now I haven't figured out if I'm going to bring it this Saturday or not, because I think Psychobabble might take up more of my time. <laughs> like I, I could see running multiple rounds of that most of the night. But if I do bring it out, I think this is one people are going to be drawn to. Well, you might want to see if your uh, if your daughter's going with you, she might want to run uh one of them yeah that's so, true she might run psycho yeah, but she's gonna she want to play psycho babble she loves psycho babble <laughs> oh she runs psycho babble and you run uh oh that's true yeah. that's true uh next up was another holiday hijinks um we've been talking about my daughter gwen she had her birthday not too long ago um and for her birthday i gave her a copy of holiday hijinks birthday burglary I can't remember what number that is, but this is another holiday hijinks game. I don't want to spoil anything, but all I have to say is this had a difficulty of one out of three, and we got way more stuck than we did on the U.S. one, despite being Canadian. So I, I don't know if just our brains weren't in the right place or what. Uh, we did play this one. Again, five players is a bit much. Um, the thing is, we have five players on Sunday. And everyone wants to take part. But I will say that, like, my youngest daughter, for the most part, doodled and did her own thing. Uh, I didn't enjoy this one as much. Like, like I, I finished off the first one going, wow, I can't believe how much puzzle was packed in this. This was so neat. Like, man, they managed to pull off a, a exit the game in 18 cards. This is really cool. To, I, this one just felt different and just wasn't as rewarding. Now, I'm not saying it's bad, but it was... I guess in a way impressive in that it was such a different experience and the way you interacted with the cards was completely different from the last game. This one was, I would say a point and click adventure game in 18 card format. It was interact with the right thing, get some tools, then figure out what tools to use with other tools to progress. Which again, I'm kind of impressed now, like like saying this out loud, I'm impressed by just how different it was from solve this puzzle to solve this puzzle to solve this puzzle. This was more about figuring out how to interact and use this with this. Could it possibly be, because I mean, we, holiday hijinks, you know, July 4th is a pretty set and established concept. It, it's, yep. it's rigid. Whereas birthday is a little bit more abstract and I can see it being a little more of a struggle to, to work out something into the idea of, um, a, you know, a holiday as, as birthday, birthday. Uh, and, and that may be, you know, because, you know, you've got facts about America that fit into July 4th. Yeah. You can't have facts about the birthday person involved yes. in, in the birthday one, you, you, unless you have, you know, 365 different versions. <laughs> Even then, you'd be sticking it to it. So I don't want to spoil anything, but it made perfect sense if I was going to do a birthday-themed game that was just about birthdays generically worldwide, that I probably would have picked this theme. Um, the thing is, if we didn't know about the U.S. knowledge from the other app and that that information was there, while it's mentioned in the instructions this is here, there is a puzzle we would have never got because this also presents a bunch of information you may need. And it's basically there in case you don't have the knowledge. If you had the knowledge, you can easily solve this puzzle. But if you don't have the knowledge, it's there if you need it. And the only reason I solved the puzzle is we were stuck for a while and I went, oh, wait, what does this give, game give us? What, what extra information is there? And I'm like, oh, okay, there's got to be a reason that's there. Yeah, okay, that matches our current puzzle. Yeah, okay, this is much easier than I thought it would be to solve. Right. But then there was a later puzzle that we got very stuck on for an extended period of time that wasn't helped that way. We just weren't thinking about it the correct way. Right. And I think that's the problem with all of these escape room games assigning them a difficulty. What one person's going to look at and go, well, obviously you just do this. Other people, six other people are going to stare at and go, I have no idea what to do with this information. <laughs> Fair enough. 
So yeah, I didn't enjoy it as much, but I still think it was an interesting, fun experience. And again, I'm I'm most impressed by just how different it was. Like even even things like at the end, you're going to use all the cards together was very different than using all the cards together in the other one. Good to know. Good to know. It, now, it, my it, last... it would actually be a shame if they had just been the same sort of thing. You know, oh, it's eight, you well, know, yeah, 12 like puzzles it... and 18 cards and yeah, it could have, it could have been you know just another exit game you know like yep. just oh it's 18 different puzzles and yes i'm impressed that marcus and inca brand keep coming up with new puzzles that's awesome but it wasn't there was a very different feel to this one i just found the other one more enjoyable i don't know it felt like more of a story i, I don't know there, there was i don't know how to describe it <laughs> you were getting things to use with other things you don't use them all and that just felt um unrewarding right like, well, we have this stuff left over. What were we supposed to do with it? This also reminded me more of the Coded Chronicles games, too. I said it was a very different experience, which actually has upped my, my view of the game the more I think about it, just because of how different it was. Uh, final game for me was a Literati uh, with the extended family. And yes, everyone liked it. It was good to play with kids at, at you know, different group than just me, D and Sean, who had played it before. And D and I tried to play, I think um, I, I dig it. We just did a review. Uh, it's <laughs> probably the best word game I own right now. And so different from Letter Jam, which is the only other cooperative word game that I can think of. That is very brain burning, puzzly, where you can't help each other. Mm -hmm. And it's all about subtle clues, whereas this was very much a free for all wait how much time do we have left we don't you have you have nine words what are we gonna do we have to figure out you have to break one of those up and make a th make make a single word what, okay i can take like the 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 rush of adrenaline while playing in literati just makes it awesome all righty well uh how about a look ahead what do we have coming up next uh well i'm gonna be hosting a game night this uh saturday in windsor come out to the barbershop bar if you happen to be local um come out we we start the the official timing of the event is 6 till 10 p.m uh you are welcome to show up earlier and play games possibly grab some food and you're also welcome to stay later as long as nothing else has booked the venue and i can't answer that right now so i need to verify that night in general though if there's nothing else booked you're welcome to stay till 2 a.m and play games um i've already mentioned i will be bringing psycho babble i may also bring uh reality shift as for games to play, we still need more plays of Castle Panic. We still have three expansions we haven't even touched. So that's pretty high up on the pile of obligation games we need to play. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, we just, we got a bunch of stuff from Origins just to like play and explore. Uh, I want to play some more. Actually, I might bring the Deadlies also on Saturday. And then there's Orum, which is a trick taking game, and Birds of a Feather. Um, we need to dive into Tome, the trick-taking game. Um, Deanna and I bought a copy of Destinies the last time we were on vacation. I haven't opened that yet, but the Pilot of Obligation probably wins out. And we have five um, regions to explore in Viticulture World. So just overall, uh, to play more games <laughs> and then review those games once we've played enough of them. Um, I think what will probably happen is we're going to start diving into some of the smaller Origins games. Um, games like Shobu and Boop, I have now played a number of times. Sean's played each of them a couple of times as well. Deanna's played many times. So we might start di dipping into the easier Origins games for reviews. But we do have some Pile of Obligation stuff still to do. And I do have another thing to build, which will be interesting because I can now do that from the new studio. Mm -hmm. um, it's called the Intrism Mini, which is uh, build your own perplexus, like, like marble run style of game. Um, and Definitely by next week, I have the latest escape box from Escape World. The latest is what they call them escape room box, but the latest wooden puzzle box. I've got an early release copy. It's a prototype, though it should be production ready. The only reason they're calling it a prototype is people like me who got review copies might spot an error because this has happened to their previous prototypes. This is currently live on Kickstarter. So if you want a sneak peek, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Power of something. Now I need to Google it. Escape Weld. Weld Kickstarter. What is the, what is the quest tower? 
the fascinating escape room in your hands. And like, if we jump over there right now and look at this thing, it just looks impressive. It, it's very much like a, a, a what, what I think of as a, a sort of stacked Chinese tower. That that's the the vision you get. Uh, you know, if you think of Chinese yeah, I, tower, I picture more of a the the um, is it Belgian the clock towers, like the the, the cuckoo clocks. Mm. Yeah, they're know. actually calling it Mesopotamian. This is oh, the Tower you. of Babel. So oh, it's supposed to be the Tower of Babel. All Seems right, like, sure. Yeah. So th- this is is well overfunded. They're only looking for like seven thousand. They're at one hundred and thirty three thousand. So it's not like they really need our help, but yeah. the fact they reached out because we have reviewed a number of these puzzles, um, I, I am looking forward to checking this out. Now I need to record an unboxing and then I need to try to solve it. But that will definitely be one we are going to review next week. So we are going to be reviewing that. The Quest Tower, we're probably going to stick with the three reviews every episode. So it's going to be the Quest Tower. It's going to be the birthday holiday hijinks because that'll be nice and quick like tonight. And then it'll be something else. I'm not sure what that something else is, but it should be a pile of obligation thing, not something new off origin. So I was a little off until once I started thinking it through, I'm like, wait, we have a couple we have to do. So I have to say, looking at the Kickstarter for this uh, Quest Tower, this looks like the most intricate and difficult one we have seen, like <laughs> uh, by a lot. Well, we'll see. We <laughs> that, shall. That, that see. should be interesting. Yeah, all it right. looks it looks awesome. I got to yeah. say, like like of all of them, standout gift. Yeah, no, it looks yeah. really cool. I'm definitely interested in that one. Okay, moving on. Somewhere I have this shown show. Up. Wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. We greatly appreciate their support. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. William Fisher. Thank you. Danielle and Owen Thomas. Thank you. Don P. Kelly. Thank you, Sean. Derek Hissel. Thanks, Derek. And Andrew Daisy. Thank you, Andrew. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop one word and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. If you dig what you heard tonight or watch, depending on how you are conge- congesting, ingesting, consuming, that's the word I was looking for, consuming our content and you don't mind initial and sometimes word babble, please consider stopping by patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and consider tipping your bellhop and maybe we can afford Mo some uh, voice uh, acting um, uh, word speaking better classes. Well, that's all for us tonight. Thank you <laughs> lobbyists for joining us live. Be sure to stick around for the penthouse suite after show for the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast. I'm Sean and I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.